Hey guys, here's the second half of September's compilation. I also want to say a thanks to my patrons. Sarah P., Kathleen Fenton, James Gorgano, Jill Hutchins, Gemma Allam, Elena Renee, Monica Levelace, Alex, and Courtney Maxwell. If anyone else fancies checking out the perks of my Patreon, the link's in the description. Enjoy the video, guys. For context, I'm a 20-year-old female. I live in the suburbs in France, in a small residence of six houses. My gate is very often broken, including today. That means 80% of the time, it is wide open. My house has one floor, where there are four bedrooms, including mine, and downstairs, there is a guest bedroom, which is used as a treatment room because I have big health concerns. This is where all the equipment and medicines are stored, like morphine in doses that could kill an average person, and this is also where the care takes place. Also, I have a dog. I am very close to him. He is my life. He feels everything, to the point of feeling my epileptic seizures before they happen. He recognizes the nurses by the sound of the tires when they arrive in the yard. He never barks, except when there's a problem. A nurse visits four to five times a day to give me care at home, including infusions. One morning, like every morning, my liberal nurse arrived at 8 a.m. I'll call her Sandra. She takes care of me as usual, that is to say an infusion of painkillers. She replaces the antibiotic diffusers, she takes a blood test, and replaces the cassette of my morphine pump. We usually chat about everything and nothing. She tells me stories about patients during the treatment. My nurses are an integral part of my life. They've looked after me for six years now. She leaves after 40 minutes and says, See you later. I'll be a little bit late, but don't worry. That day, I have a medical appointment in the morning, and I'm alone all day, except for the nurses' visits, because my parents are working. Once back from my meeting, I sit on the sofa with my dog while waiting for my nurse. After a while, I hear the tire noises. I get up because I think it's my nurse, but my dog starts to growl behind the door. I look at the time and it's 11.50 a.m. I tell myself that is a bit early, but sometimes instead of going after, my nurse exchanges me with the patient from before. I hear a knock and... Surprised, I go to open it. I see a young woman standing there, whom I have never seen before. She says, Hello, are you Chloe? I'm Camille, a third year nursing student. Your nurse will be a little late, so she told me to come start preparing, and then she'll arrive. I'm not wary at all. I'm used to students coming, but I'm just a little surprised Sandra didn't warn me. She usually warns me in the morning, or just sends a message, and she never leaves a student alone when it's the first time we meet each other. I tell myself she must have forgotten to tell me. I bring her in and show her the way to the treatment room. I take out the things for treatment while she washes her hands. My dog is weird. He growls at her as soon as she approaches me, and he runs around me. I was embarrassed, so I left him in the living room and closed the door for some quiet. I don't really care what she does, I let her do it as I'm on my phone. She begins to put the IV on the infusion stand and takes a syringe. Normally we rinse my central catheter with a syringe of serum already made. You just have to open the packaging. But I see it's not a pre-made syringe, but a syringe that she has prepared. I look up and see the ampoules for my treatment are intact and have not yet been opened, yet I did hear the sound of ampoules breaking. I'm starting to think it's weird and she starts to approach me to inject the syringe when I get a message from my nurse. I'll be there in five minutes. Can you start pulling out the material? Oh my god. I get up and say, I, I, I gotta go to the bathroom. I'm desperate. I run and lock myself in the downstairs toilet. The whole time my dog is barking and growling. When I open the door, he follows me straight up, so we're both in the toilet. 
so I sent a message to my nurse. There is Camille, your student here. Don't worry. And then she replies, Who? I started crying in the toilet, and I am really, really scared. Camille comes to the door and says, Is everything okay? I think she can see I was taking my time. I say, Yes, yes, I'll be out soon. Then I hear my front door slam. Two minutes later, I hear it reopen, but I hear my nurse. I come out of the toilet crying. She asks me what happened, and I tell her about it and show her the treatment room. We call the police. They come and examine, and they take some samples and the syringe and the rest of what Camille had prepared. The test results arrive a few days after. In the syringe was a paralytic. She put in a dose that could have paralyzed a 120 kilogram man, and I'm 40 kilograms. And in the IV was a medicine to lower the heart rate, so concentrated it could have stopped anyone's heart. Today, we still don't know who Camille is, and luckily, I have never heard from her again. She stole all my opioids, but nothing else of value, even though I had an iPad in plain sight. In retrospect, I realized that my dog had sensed that this person wished me ill, and I tell myself that I should have watched her because she was just a student and my treatments are more than just paracetamol. I keep wondering what could have happened if I hadn't looked at my phone. I live in a small, small town. You blink and you miss it. The best we can boast about is a single stop sign and a gas station, which we only have because of a nearby highway. Any actual semblance of a town is 25 minutes away, so when things get scary out here, it's amplified. The occasional homeless person is no big deal. They're often drifting through. Drug addicts run rampant and will steal everything they can from your house. But it's the normal out here. However, what happened a few years ago certainly wasn't normal. Originally, I was dead asleep in my bed. I only woke up because it was burning hot in my room, but it was summertime and not much I could do. I just remember tossing and turning until I got a creepy feeling that fell into the pit of my stomach. I glanced over to the bathroom door that was open with the light on. Everything was normal. I left the light on so I wouldn't trip and die if I had to pee in the middle of the night. Next, I glanced at the window directly across from my bed. I had no curtains, but I did have a shitty set of blinds. Part of the blinds are broken from the wear and tear, and the crappy AC output beneath it would make them move back and forth, so you'd get a glimpse outside every so often. The yard light was still going, but what made me stop was the outline at my window. The figure of someone was directly at my window, almost like it was waiting for the blinds to move, to watch me. I didn't have an imagination as a child that had been trained out of me, but the sight was enough to pour every horror film into my head at that moment. I squeezed my eyes shut and pulled the blankets over my head and slept in a cloth oven that night. By morning time, the figure was gone. I remember running to my mom's room on the verge of tears in the morning, telling her what happened. She laughed at me like I was an idiot and told me it was probably just a stray cat that had climbed up there. For one odd reason or another, I almost believed her since my window was pretty high off the ground. But something didn't sit right. Later that day, when we were doing yard work, I glanced over at my window and saw one of our metal patio chairs had been pushed up to it. I pointed it out to my mom, who proceeded to chew me out. That's how the cat probably got up there, moron. Stop leaving furniture everywhere. But I hadn't moved it. It was heavy enough that I struggled with it. We moved it back, and so began a pattern. At night, I'd see the figure, complain to my mom, and we'd find the chair moved back every single morning. This went on for weeks. My mother stopped caring about my concerns until one morning 
when we saw the outside of my screen window had been sliced open. I still remember her shaking her head and complaining about those damn stray cats that we had still yet to see. I could tell she was unnerved by that development. I couldn't handle it anymore and I opted to sleep in our living room that night. The only problem was our kitchen and living room connected which meant there were several windows. The first night of my move went well. Despite my back hurting from the couch, I avoided my room like the plague. It wasn't until about four days later we ran into an issue. I woke up and looked at the clock above the fireplace. It read a little past 3am. I couldn't realize why I'd woken up until it happened. There was a beam of light shining in from the kitchen window almost like someone was shining a flashlight in. I saw it trace along the walls and land on the love seat across from the couch I was on. I was mortified. When I told my mom, she continued to laugh at me. I gave in and decided that I would sleep in my dad's room, even though it had a gigantic window. He slept in the recliner with a huge TV, so I felt more safe having someone around. The yard light was directly outside the window anyways. It seemed foolproof. That was until I woke up out of habitual fear and watched through the window across from the bed. Everything seemed normal as time went on and I felt like a moron. Maybe my mom was right. That was until I saw a lone figure come out of the woods by the backyard shed. It walked directly under the light and head to the patio furniture like he'd been there plenty of times before. I still remember the large build the man had and the confidence like he was the one who lived here, like he wasn't creeping around my yard in the dead of night. I just remember listening to the TV until I fell asleep again, hoping to get another glimpse. My dad would have been pissed off if I had woken him. He was grumpy on a good day and terrifying on a bad day. I didn't feel like risking it until I had solid proof, because I was scared. The next morning, my mom chewed me out again for the patio furniture, which was routine almost a month later. But this time, something new had happened. She demanded that I stop playing with the toolboxes in the garage. A bunch of tools had been taken out and left on our doorstep. Screwdrivers, a large hammer, flashlights, that sort of thing. It wasn't me. I begged with my mom and pleaded with her. Just stay up with me one night. We couldn't close our garage because it was an open carport and I wasn't going to get my ass beaten for touching tools because of someone else. It was driving me mad. Finally, she agreed. That night, we would stay awake in the living room. I finally fell asleep before my mom did, but I remember her waking me up in a panic. She pointed to the window that overlooked into our garage. We could see the top of someone's head as they walked back and forth. There was sound of someone placing metal tools down on the brick steps, as if they were trying to be quiet but couldn't fully muffle it. She whispered for me to go wake my dad. My dad was angry having been woken up in the middle of the night by his frantic daughter. He grabbed his pistol and headed out for the back door towards the front of the house where the garage was located. We heard my dad screaming and someone dropping tools, then the shot of a gun twice. The frantic footsteps pounding out of the garage felt like they were coming from my chest. My mom picked out the window, then opened the door, and my dad stumbled in. He had missed both shots because of his unstable aim, but told us the man was crouching at our front door, looking at our door handle. None of us slept that night, and in the morning, the law from the closest town arrived. They didn't do much besides ask us if anything had been stolen for a description of the man and then told us to install cameras. That was it. They said the guy was probably just looking for something easy to steal for quick money. If that had been the case, why hadn't he stolen the tools, the generator, the welder, or broken into any of the vehicles just sitting in the garage? We finally set up hunting trail cameras around the house, but nothing has happened since. 
Coming home from college for holidays, I still have nightmares about the incidents years later when I sleep in my own bed. I don't know what he was looking for or why he did the things he did. Whatever the case may be, man at the window, let's not meet. When I was 18, I worked at my college's residence building at the front desk, and I think I almost got assaulted or murdered. You be the judge. During the summer, the building operated as a hotel, so two and a half floors were hotel rooms, and half of the third floor were student rooms. The whole thing was operated with a hotel swipe key system that was pretty outdated, and all the doors were powered by four AA batteries. If the batteries died, there was a decently lengthy process to replace them and reprogram the door. A dark-haired guy came to the front desk from inside the building while I was working an overnight shift at around 1 or 2 a.m. He said he left his keycard in his room. I made him a new one and made my first error of the night. Hotel guests could have as many room keys remade as they wanted, hypothetically. Students, however, were supposed to be given a temporary keycard to be returned when theirs is located and charged two dollars. I gave him a new key for his room and asked if he was a student or a hotel guest. He replied, student. At this point, I should have checked our system to charge his account, but I was caught up doing administrative duties and I forgot. I used to trust people way too easily at this job, but quickly learned not to. Later on that night, maybe around 3 or 4 a.m., he came to the desk again and said he couldn't get into his room. I asked if he just forgot his key again, and he said no, the door wasn't working. I asked if the light was coming on when he swiped his card, and he said no. So I figured the batteries were dead. I told him I'd have to change the batteries and went up to his room with him. He asked me for my name, and I told him. He didn't tell me his. I opened the room door manually with a master key and told him I'd have to prop it open while I did some work on the back panel to replace the batteries. He said, no, it's okay, I'll close it. He then closed and deadbolted the door. Really weird, but I tried not to think about it. I had changed the batteries on plenty of other doors by this point, and some students were iffy about having the doors propped open due to the fact their room would be on display for anyone walking by. He also had a really thick accent, so I thought he might be an international student. We had a lot of students from other countries where English was not their first language. And I gave him the benefit of the doubt and thought maybe it was just a language barrier issue. At this point, though, I really felt like something was wrong, but I tried to ignore it so I didn't freak him out. While I was trying to focus on fixing the door as quickly as possible, he kept trying to entice me to go further into the room, saying that his bed was broken and he needed me to take a look at it. There was something underneath it that needed to be fixed. He held out a small gold house key and said, I have a key, go get it and threw it under the bed. He said there was a leak under the fridge. He just kept trying to get me down to the ground, throwing random problems at me. Obviously, I told him no. I'd send maintenance up in the morning to take a look at it to see if anything was broken. I had my back to him and he asked me to take my glasses off. I said, no, I need them to see. His tone of voice changed in the most steady, chilling manner. He said, Ella, it's okay. You can take them off. And from behind me, he reached around and tried to take off my glasses. I swatted his hand away and trying to keep composure said, No thanks, I need to keep them on. Even though he was creeping me out, I didn't want to be rude to him. I didn't want to get into trouble if he complained about me or risk upsetting him and having him yell at me. I got up to grab something from the door repair kit and I undid the door deadbolt and opened it up in the process. He jumped toward the door to close it again and told me to keep it closed. 
I told him no, I had to open it, to start reprogramming it from the front. While I held the door open with my foot and grabbed something from the door repair kit, he started playing with the little wisps of hair at the top of my forehead and trying to touch my shoulder. I swatted him away again and asked him not to touch me. I focused on getting out of there. He once again tried to get me to follow him into the bedroom, saying the bed was broken. I went as far as the door frame to see if I could spot any actual problem with his bed. This is when I realized that he had nothing in his room. No dishes in the kitchen, no shower curtain in the bathroom, no sheets on the bed, nothing. This wasn't his room. My brain once again went back to the international student theory, thinking maybe he just arrived today and hadn't gotten a chance to buy anything yet. But in the pit of my stomach, I knew something was wrong. I fiddled around with the door for a few more seconds before announcing that it was fixed and quickly gathered the door kit and left. Before I had reached the elevator, he came back out without his shoes on to follow me. He tried to get back in to get his shoes and called out, Ella, the door isn't fixed, you need to come back. I went back and opened the door manually and told him if the door was broken, I'd have to send up maintenance in the morning to fix it. I knew he was going to follow me to the elevator again, so I closed the door behind me once he went inside and ran down the stairwell as fast as I could. When I got to the front desk, I checked the computer. I saw the room he was in was supposed to be empty. It wasn't a student room or a hotel room. I locked myself in the back office and then called campus security. He came down a few minutes later and went behind the desk. I yelled at him to get on the other side and wait, now that I knew he wasn't a resident. He tore off a corner slip of paper I had sitting on the desk and drew a flower on it then put it back on top of my papers. When security arrived, he ran back up to the empty room and tried convincing him that he lived there so he wouldn't have to leave. He kept showing them his key, which had decided to work on his door again somehow. They escorted him back downstairs and came to ask me if he really did live there. Obviously he didn't, that's why I called you guys crying and terrified. He kept interjecting to argue that he did live there but couldn't even recall his room number when asked. Security asked for his student card and he couldn't produce it, so they told him he'd have to leave if he couldn't prove he lived there. While they were grabbing his information, I listened from the office and I could immediately tell he was lying. The phone number he gave was just a bunch of random numbers. The name he gave was prefixed by, um, as if he was trying to think of a name. When they asked him for his address, he just said, across the street. One security guard asked if he lived in the apartment across the street, and he said yes, but couldn't tell them what the building number was. He said his apartment was 1200, but I moved into that building a few months later, and apartment 1200 doesn't exist. When security asked what his purpose was to be sneaking into a room, he just kept up the ums and ahs, and saying he didn't know. They'd ask, were you trying to see a friend? Do you know anybody who lives here? Were you here to hurt somebody? He just kept fidgeting and saying, I don't know, no reason, I was just here. At one point, he tried to tell them he was my friend, and to that, I poked my head out of the office to say that I literally had never seen him before that night. He left. We didn't call the police because he didn't actually do anything but it was still unsettling. Later on, it dawned on me how he figured the room was vacant. One of the housekeepers had been using it as her personal break room. A few days later, a housekeeper came into the desk. They told me they found the door deadbolt open, the TV on, and a housekeeper inside watching TV. She must have forgotten to close the door when she left for the night, and when the creep let himself into the building, he found it. I never saw him again. And to this day, I have no clue what he was doing there. I haven't worked there since last winter, and overnight shifts still give me the creeps. A little context. My dad and I lived together in our own multifamily home in Germany. 
My dad has a serious lung condition. His lungs produce and trap excessive amounts of mucus. The trapped amount is huge and keeps his lungs from working correctly. It's pretty normal that he has to be picked up by an ambulance every two to three weeks because he can't breathe anymore. Last week, it was that time of the month, he couldn't breathe. I called an ambulance. He was brought to the closest hospital. It's pretty normal for me because this happened at least 10 times in the last six months. So I went to bed after he got picked up. I went to work the next morning and I got a text from him saying that he has to stay for at least two more days. Wednesday evening, I got home from work and played a match of rogue company when suddenly someone rang the doorbell. That's unusual because we never have unannounced visitors. I walked to the door and was about to press the door buzzer to open the main door when I heard, I believe, more than one voice directly in front of my door. So that someone just got past the main door. Weird. I asked, hello, who is it? Silence for three seconds. Then a person who sounds like my father, but at the same time doesn't sound like my father, answers. Misha, it's me. I forgot my keys. Open the door. And I thought, okay, in that case, wait a minute. My dad never calls me Misha. Only Mishi. And there was a sarcastic tone in that voice. I didn't trust the situation. I called my father on his phone. If the person in front of my door was my father, his phone should ring, right? Right, it didn't. Big whoop. My father answered, and as I suspected, he was still in hospital. Meanwhile, the two persons on the other side of the door heard my phone call and started kicking my door. Let me in, Misha. It's your daddy. Let me in. Thank God that door is reinforced. After I threatened them with calling the police and having a big ass knife in my hand, they left. I heard their footsteps running down the staircase. I rushed to a window facing the street to check to see if I can see a car or license plate. Nothing, just a few footsteps in the distance. They never came back. What's weird is that they knew my name and that my father wasn't home despite his car being in the driveway. Shit was hitting the fan when a buddy reported something similar. We called the police and unfortunately the police investigation was stopped because there were no clues. Nothing. Not a single footprint. I asked my friend if they had encountered them again. Nothing. Let me preface this by saying I work in a well-populated town with a low crime rate and no reason to outright assume any of these actions were what I later found out to be sex trafficking attempts. I work at a popular coffee chain, generally doing afternoon and closing shifts. This particular night, we had a very young crew for closing, which happens at 10.30pm. For reference, we have our shift lead, who's 19 and female, who we will call Sarah, myself, 17 and female, my co-worker, who's also 17, who we will call Mia, and another co-worker, who's 18, and we'll call D. It had been a relatively slow night, with only a few loyal regulars dropping by. Both drive through and the calf were empty, as heavy rainfall had started, and no one wanted to be out. I was in the front of the store cleaning, while the rest of my co-workers were in the back of the store, when an older man walks in. He wore odd clothing, a bit strange for the humid weather. Full black attire with combat boots, a heavy red jacket, and a beanie on his head obscuring his hair. I brushed it off as protection from the storm and figured he worked outside. I went to ask if he placed an order online as he stood at the mobile counter. Putting on my customer service voice, I smiled and then went through my standard spiel. But I was alarmed when instead of responding, he places a bag on the counter and starts pulling out DVDs. Once he finishes pulling out a stack of ten or so, he stares past me into the back room 
where my co-workers were obviously chatting, and then makes a lap around the store, eyeing me the entire time and not speaking a word. He backs out of the front door and walks out to his truck, which I now see is a large black pickup truck. Freak the hell out, I stupidly grab the stack of DVDs and run back to my co-workers. They're immediately alarmed by my demeanor and ask me what's wrong. I hold out the DVDs and let them inspect them while I explain what happened. Much to my discomfort, Sarah points out that all of these movies are either about murders or kidnappings. Slightly pissed off and extremely uncomfortable, we make the decision to call my manager. He picks up and Sarah explains the situation. While I comfort Dee and Mia, who are freaked out, probably more so than I am at the time, he tells us that there's nothing more we can do about it, but to call back if anything else happens. So we hang up and move back to the front of the store as a group. Things go as usual, but with an air of fear about us. Mia sticks to my side and Dee to Sarah's. The man's truck had pulled off at that point, but much to my dismay, I had now pulled into the now closed grocery store next door. That had a very clear view into the drive through window. A few cars pull up to the drive through and I even have a few customers ask if I was alright, due to my what I assumed to be terrified face. I've always had a pretty good intuition about things, and this felt more wrong than anything else I've ever felt. A bit more time passes by, and it's now time for Dee to leave. With the man still in the parking lot next door, we decided it would probably be best for her boyfriend, who we'll call Daniel, to come pick her up. This wasn't an irregular occurrence, and we didn't want him following her home. Mia then points out that a van had been sitting in the back of the parking lot for almost an hour at that point, which we had not previously noticed. Another gut feeling hits, and I make the decision to lock the door. Daniel tells her he's on his way, and I inform my manager that we closed the calf for peace of mind, which he was fine with, as business was slow. Now Sarah and Dee are in the back, and Mia and I are in the front. I go about cleaning the machines, and trying to make idle chatter with her to keep her calm, which is no small feat, as she jumps every time she hears someone steaming milk. As we're talking, I have my back turned to her. She screams mid-sentence, get out. Alarmed, I whip around to see she is standing near the counter close to the drive through window and I saw her pointing to a shadowy figure climbing through the window. Grabbing her arm, I yank me up behind me and grab the hot bucket of sanitizer I had been using to scrub the counters around the machines. I throw the liquid onto him, simultaneously pushing the man out of the window, which he only had his shoulders through, with the big red bucket now on his head. At the same time, Daniel pulls up outside. Mia is now yelling for someone to call the police, and I see Dee in my peripheral running outside to our new savior. I slam the drive through window shut and lock them, with the man still laying on the ground, struggling to get his bearings. I couldn't tell you how much time had passed, although it couldn't have been more than 15 to 30 seconds, before I see Daniel rush the man, who was now on his knees and pinned to the ground. Sarah and Mia were now pulling me into the back of the store, both of them fighting back the urge to sob, and Sarah on the phone with the police. Thankfully, we have some awesome regulars, who are also deputies that arrived within five minutes of our call, and they arrested the man. The aftermath was messy, but they eventually pinned him as a member of the local trafficking ring that had been caught years prior, and let out on bail. Oh yeah and the van in the back that had kept Dee from leaving in the first place. It hightailed it out of the parking lot in the middle of all the action, but it was eventually traced back to the people who were also a part of that ring. I still work there, and I am very grateful for Daniel, who very well could have saved all of our lives at that moment. He managed to keep the man pinned the entire time, until the police arrived and disarmed him, the true hero of this story. Although I do pride myself on my quick thinking, for getting him out of the store. Moral of the story, 
trust your gut feelings and always have a steaming hot bucket of sanitizer on hand. For reference, I work as a barista in a coffee shop inside a larger store. I'm one of a handful of male baristas at my shop. I am gay and very open about this. I wear pride shoes, I have a pride flag attached to my name tag, and I have a couple of wristbands with rainbows and phrases like Orlando Strong and a local LGBT plus center. So, the other day I was working my shift at the register. A gentleman comes up to me and smiles. I think he noticed the pride flag on my name tag, but he didn't explicitly mention it at first. He says he doesn't know how to order and asks for my opinion. Now, I am not particularly a coffee drinker, but I know what drinks fit for different tastes, so I ask him what he likes and I try to give him recommendations. As I'm talking, I can tell he's paying more attention to me than to what I'm saying, which I am completely okay with. He was a shorter but well-built man, had beautiful eyes, a nice beard, basically the perfect dilf. Eventually, he decides on a super sweet ice drink that we have, and I go make it for him. As I'm making the drink, one of my co-workers leans over and whispers, I think that customer just took a picture of you. That was a bit of a red flag, but I thanked her and kind of brushed it off. I give him his drink and he smiles. He points to the pride flag and says, I love that flag. Where can I get one of those? I laughed and said I got it from a pride event which I went to a few years ago. He then said, and where can I get the person it's attached to? I immediately feel a rush and I start blushing, but trying to act professional, I brush it off. He eventually takes his drink and sits down at one of the tables. I continue going out about my day, debating whether or not I should give in to this guy. Every now and then, I would glance at his table to see him looking at me. No matter when I looked, it seemed like he was looking at me. I started to get that weird feeling of hard eyes with red flags. And then I notice he hasn't taken a single drink out of his coffee. Obviously being an ice drink, it was made in a clear plastic cup. When I have a break and go to wipe down some tables, I stop by his table and ask if he didn't like the drink. And if not, I could make him a new one, free of charge. He hands me the drink and mentions he's not too sure if it's too sweet for him or not, and he asks me to try it. I politely decline, telling him that I don't drink coffee. He's shocked and asks me why I work here, and blah blah blah. As we're talking though, his questions start to change. So, do you lift it all? No. Not really. Well, how much do you think you could lift if you had to? The job requirement is 50 pounds, so I guess at least that much. Well, I've learned that it's good to be able to lift at least half your body weight. How much do you weigh? Immediate red flags go off. There was something about the combination of the drink and the two questions that made me feel like I was being asked how much of a fight I'd be able to hold especially if I was drugged. I've been drugged at a party before, and these things are red flags that I've learned to pick up on. So, I kindly and quickly ended the conversation and go back to cleaning tables. As the hours go by, he continues to sit there, not drinking his drink. Other employees and a couple of managers ask if everything's okay. He says he's perfectly happy, Every now and then, he takes a phone call, and at one point, I swear, I can see a guy on his phone at a different part of the store, talking opposite of the guy at the table. Suddenly, I start to feel like there are more eyes on me than I realize. I pull one of my managers to the back and tell him that I'm getting weirder and weirder feelings about the guy, and the manager says we'll keep an eye on him. Now, I was closing on this shift, and so as we got closer and closer to closing time, I noticed him still sitting there. 
When the announcement that the store is closing in half an hour is made, he comes up to the counter and asks if he can walk me to my car after I get off. I tell him our closing duties take us at least 45 minutes after we close, and he says he'll be happy to wait. I politely decline, and he asks when I work next. I tell him I'm off for a couple of weeks. Well, then I feel like I should walk you to your car, especially if I might not be able to see you for a couple of weeks. No way. I politely declined, and eventually he leaves. I finish my closing duties and head to the employee area. As soon as I get down there, I tell one of my managers about the situation and ask if I can take the side exit from the store. At our store, we exit out of the main doors after we close, but there's a side door that we use to get into the building before we open and that the managers use to get out after we close. He agrees and tells me he'd walk with me to my car to make sure I'm okay if I'm okay waiting a little while. I am, so I walk out the side doors with a couple of managers. I get into my car and, as I'm driving away, I see a large van with extremely tinted windows parked in front of the front door. There's no way to know for sure if my customer was in that van and if it was as ominous as I thought it was, but I know that I was not about to stay to figure out. I took a long, and winding path home that night. For some background, I lived in a small town and the store was a mere five to seven minute walk from my apartment block. I was 18 and trying to save up for further studies, but I never expected that this job at the store would bring me so much terror. It was, and still is, situated in a part of town full of alcoholics, addicts, and overall creepy dudes. So, it was a hot summer evening, and I, as usual, was working at the cash register. I was generally liked by the customers because I was nice to everyone and liked to strike up conversation. I noticed the guy walk by the animal food and necessity aisle a few times, but paid no attention until something creepy started happening. My coworker replaced me and I went to stack up the toiletries and such. That's when I got a better look at the guy, tall, scrawny, wearing what seemed to be a leather jacket, no outstanding facial hair, but his eyes, they were so wide and I got the chills. I tried to pay no attention, but he kept walking around staring at me. If I turned to him, he would walk a few steps and continue staring at me. My shift was supposed to end soon, so I hoped he would leave. He didn't. He even followed me close to the employee's room. I told the security guard to ask the guy to leave or else buy something and go. I'm not sure what happened as I quickly gathered my stuff and bolted out. My mistake. I should have hidden or ran home but I figured that since the security guard spoke to him, he would not do anything more. I remember I put in my headphones and put my phone in my bag. I noticed that I left my hat in the employee's room and was going to turn back and retrieve it when I saw him. He was around five meters away from me, standing quietly and just staring. I started walking quickly, passing by a gas station, but he was still following me. He followed me down a path to my apartment building. At this point, my heart was racing. And I was like, this is it. He's going to do something. I looked back. He was still standing behind me, still staring. Fortunately, my brother approached me out of nowhere, and the guy quickly turned around and walked away. I was scared to leave the apartment for three days until I had to go back to work again. I never saw him again. I work part-time at a grocery store and I usually work the closing shift. About 30 minutes to close, a lady comes up to my register. She's polite, friendly, and seemed very normal. She pays for her groceries and I hand her the receipt. Then she leaves. 
seemed normal to me. About ten minutes after we close, I'm headed out to my bike, but she stopped me before I leave the store, claiming that she left her phone inside and that she needed to go get it. She hadn't left her phone, it would have been at my register, and I had thoroughly cleaned it, as well as its surrounding area, before I clocked out, but I offered to go in and check anyway, because maybe it had been dropped on the floor. I wanted to go home, and luckily my manager offered to call her phone, so I headed out to my bike to get going. The moment I take the lock off my bike, she drives over to me, making small talk. It's a bit weird, seeing as I'm clearly trying to get home, and she doesn't know me at all. She tells me that I have a cool bike, asking me where I got it. I explain to her it's electric, and that I just got it off of Amazon. She tells me that she didn't know they made electric bikes, but then tells me a few minutes later about how she's been looking to get an electric bike for a while now. She asked to take a picture of my bike, and then suddenly asked me why I was wearing a mask, going on about how it could give me sinus problems. I decide not to take it off, since she's taken a photo, which I notice the camera is aimed more so at me than my bike. Even though I stepped away, so she could get a better view of my bike by itself. Unknown to me, my manager and another worker were watching this whole interaction. After this woman left, they came over me and asked if I was okay. I didn't really think much of it, telling them that I was fine and that all she wanted to know was about my bike. I headed home, but on my way, I thought a bit more about the interaction. She came back to the store, claiming to have lost her phone, but had it on her the whole time. She took a picture with it. She kept repeating my name in our conversation, as often as she could, almost like she was trying to memorize it. She took a photo of me, as well as my mode of transportation, all while trying to get me to take off my mask, right before taking the photo, as if to be able to see my entire face. Sort of creepy. Even weirder was when I turned back to the store to see if she was still there. I saw a police car, which, after leaving the parking lot, turned on its sirens and sped off in the direction the lady went in. Maybe I'm overthinking, but this interaction just really seems strange. I used to work at one of those 24-7 Walmart super centers. I was right out of high school, 19 and female. I worked as a cashier for two terrible years where I was subjected to all kinds of abuse from customers and co-workers alike. I mean, I was screamed at, slammed into a register face first, groped, and even farted on once. Because this old lady was mad that the oranges were priced each and not by the pound. However, the time that sticks out in my head the most is the customer that tried to follow me home. I had just started my shift, and the second I got on the register, I had a line of about 10 people long. For some reason, the Walmart I worked at never had enough registers open, so people were usually mad and impatient by the time they got to me. I get right to work and keep a smile plastered to my face while making the minimal mandatory small talk. Hey, how are you? Did you find everything? Kind of thing. Most customers were polite, but not very interested in talking. So it's easy to fall into a bit of a cashier robot mode. I get to this guy, who had only two items, yogurt and band-aids. I ring it all up in record time and neatly bag it up, but the customer doesn't seem to be paying any attention. He wouldn't look at me or answer my greeting. His eyes just stared right down at the conveyor belt. Maybe he was a bit zoned out. The conveyor belt didn't look too dirty. I hadn't had the chance to wash it yet, because the second I'd walked over to the register, people lined up. I tell the man his total, which was something like $4.36, and he starts fishing in his pockets for exact change without looking up. Inwardly, I groan, but keep my customer service smile fixed in place while I wait. 
He's wearing one of those muddy brown denim jackets with lots of pockets, and as he rifles through, I keep catching whiffs of stale B.O. and cigarettes. His hands were pretty dirty too, and all dried out from the cold weather. He dumps an assortment of change on the counter, still not looking at me, and I begin to count it all up. Everything is uncomfortably quiet. I can feel the eyes of every customer waiting in line, boring into me. All except this guy, who was then digging in his pants pockets too. He was about 30 cents short. I let him know, once I was sure he wasn't going to find any more coins. It was then that he looks at me, making this scrunched up face. His eyes were very dark brown, almost black, and they pierced right into me, accusingly, as if he thought I was lying or something. While he was watching, I counted everything again. It's only 30 cents. Can't you just give me your employee discount? No, that's against the rules, I answered apologetically. Want to put something back? I wasn't about to get fired for giving someone my discount, which was only 10% if you're wondering. He wasn't the first person to ask for it, but most people pretend they were joking. He was not joking. No, I want them, he said while glaring at me. I was beginning to wish he'd start staring at the conveyor belt again, instead of at me. He was making me pretty uncomfortable. If I'd had 30 cents in my pocket, I would have paid for it myself, just to get this guy to leave. He reaches over to take the bag, but I turn the little bag carousel so that he can't. I know you get a discount, just plug it in. He completely blows up at this point, but I just shake my head and look at the other customers. People are watching, but no one does anything. This is just something that's inconveniencing them, even though I'm actually pretty scared. I'd already started flashing my register light so that the CMS would come, but they were notorious for taking their sweet time. I'll get a CMS, but it might take a few minutes, I nervously offer. But the man just goes off and goes on about how it's not that much and he needs it, with some explicit language thrown in, of course. He leaves before the supervisor comes over, grabbing all of his change and shoving it all into one pocket before stomping off. I'm relieved that he's gone and continue working in uneasy silence. Everything seemed to go on as normal after that. My shift ends at midnight, and I managed to clock out on time for once. I didn't have a car, and I would normally call my mom to pick me up, but she was out of town, and it was too late to call anyone else. So I decided to walk, rather than waste money on a cab. I lived about 20 minutes away, and felt pretty safe walking, because you didn't really tend to run into other pedestrians at that hour. After a few minutes of walking, I noticed a car was driving really slowly behind me. The speed limit was 45 miles an hour, and this car was probably going about 10. I got a bad gut feeling and walked a little faster, trying to rationalize it. It could have been someone who wanted to offer me a ride or get directions. But no, whoever it was stayed behind me and didn't try to pull up next to me at all, even though they were going really slow. After about five minutes of this, the car finally turns off into one of the neighborhoods. I was relieved, but it was short-lived. The driver parks his car up on the curb and gets out of the car, then comes jogging up to me. I realize immediately that it was the yogurt band-aid guy. He's wearing the same exact muddy brown jacket and is staring at me with those dark eyes. I turn around and start jogging down the sidewalk and he just jogs up right next to me. I can actually hear the change jingling in his pocket. He doesn't say anything at first, so I just try to run faster without slipping. Had this guy been sitting in the parking lot for hours, waiting for me to get off of work? Apparently so. I feel him staring at me and turn my head to look at him while still running as fast as I can on ice. What color is your underwear? He asks. 
This question horrified and disgusted me, so my immediate reaction was telling him don't be a creep, and I punched him right in the face. It hurt my hand like a bitch, but he stops running for a second and bends forward, clutching his face. I swear I heard him say okay, but I just keep running and I'm too scared to look back. I'm not sure if he kept following me after that, but I didn't run straight home because I was scared of him, figuring out where I lived. When I did make it home, probably an hour later, I went to my landlady's apartment first and told her what happened. I was really shaken up. I told her that if she saw a suspicious guy around the building, she should call the police. My mom was out of town and didn't answer my calls, so I watched Disney movies until I was calm enough to go to sleep. The next day I told the managers at work what happened, but they didn't care. In hindsight, I probably should have called the police, but I was young, and I thought that if it wasn't necessary, management would have told me to do it. I felt pretty angry that they didn't take me seriously or care that I was scared. I wanted to go home early because I was scared that guy would show up again, but they told me no and made me go to the registers. I quit shortly after that. I never did see Yogurt Band-Aid guy again, but it's been about 10 years and I'm not even sure I'd recognize him even if I did. I grew up in an 8 bedroom farmhouse with my dad until I grew up and moved out. We always had extra rooms not being used and because of the age of the house plus all this extra space there was always an eeriness like someone looming in the shadows. If I had to get a drink at night I looked at the ground the whole time because I was scared of what may be looking back at me from the dark corners, rooms and hallways. Even the windows and mirrors were avoided because I wasn't sure what I'd see looking back at me. When I was around 12 years old, I questioned why the room that used to be my nursery was locked from the outside. I didn't think it was weird before then. My dad needed a room for storage and I figured he just wanted to keep me out. I brought it up to him one day, asking what's so important in there that he needs to keep me out. Even though I'm not a child anymore, typical 12 year old mentality. Turns out, I was not entirely correct about the lock. My dad, with a very serious demeanor, sat me down and answered my inquiry. When I was one to two years old, I slept in this nursery room on the second floor next to my dad's room. This room was painted by my sister, especially for me, with Winnie the Pooh characters and fluffy clouds. The type of thing I think back on and appreciate. The effort and creativity was so admirable. I have a photo of me smiling at Pooh Bear on the wall while we were setting it up. Anyway, I was in this nursery in my crib, again, right next to my dad's room, the perfect age to be on my own. Every night though, my dad was woken up by me screaming and crying. He had raised four children before me, so he was not making first time parent mistakes that would otherwise be in question. He thought it was probably the switch to being in my own room rather than being in his that caused my nightly discomfort. He considered bringing my crib back into his room, but of course, the nursery was all ready to go. I had just graduated to it. For a while, when I cried in terror, he would come in and check on me, only to find that nothing was wrong, in the sense of present stressors like temperature, diaper change, hungry or thirsty. He would stay with me until I fell asleep, or he'd keep the light on to make me feel safer, and then return to his room to get some actual rest. One night, after having enough of my distress, he decided to camp out on the floor of my nursery to see if he could figure out what was the matter, but mostly to try and sleep through the night. This was the last time anyone slept in there. I was able to doze off now that I wasn't alone. He, on the other hand, was tossing and turning on hardwood floor, not comfortable enough to sleep. As he lay there on the floor, mulling over the situation, boom, boom, boom. He was jolted to his feet by a few massive blows to the floorboards beneath him 
centered directly on his back, as if someone on the first floor had a battering ram aimed right at the ceiling. His first instinct was to rush downstairs and check for intruders. He is a man of logic, brave and ready to defend his family. However, when he got down there, the lights were off. There was no one downstairs. The front door locked. The windows locked. No sign of forced entry. No one else lived with us. Our closest neighbor was down the road, a quarter of a mile. And why would they break in just to bang on the ceiling? let alone have it mapped out where my dad would be sleeping in my nursery. And the force of the blows. This wasn't normal. After this event, my dad brought my crib back into his bedroom, and I was able to sleep without screaming or crying beyond needing a diaper change or something normal. He brought the Bible into the nursery for extra measure and casted out any evil that may have invited itself there. He locked up that nursery and only used it for storage after that. He only went in during the daytime. To this day, that old lock is still on the door, as if a lock will keep spirits locked in. Short of pretending that experience never happened, he couldn't rationalize it enough to do anything else. We think that entity was evil and malicious, and when my dad tried protecting me, that only made it pissed off. As I grew up in that house, I had a hard time sleeping in my room on my own. Many nights, I ended up rushing to the couch in the living room, turning the TV on, and watching Disney till I fell asleep. But even then, I was not comfortable. There were always eyes on me. There were many more unexplained events from that farmhouse, but this was the most direct encounter with evil my dad has ever had. When my husband and I first married, we lived towns apart due to work. We also had a toddler. We decided to move in together as quickly as possible and then went house hunting. I have always enjoyed stories of supernatural or paranormal occurrences and joked about how much I would love a haunted house. I was later told by a clairvoyant that the universe delivers. We finally settled on a house that was in our price range. It was built in the 80s, so no concern for lead paint, nor historic value. Everything went smoothly for the most part. Our toddler would wake up in the middle of the night and explain that her stuffed animals would move or fly. We figured she just wanted to sleep with us. Moving was a big transition for such a youngster. We got pregnant again fairly quickly, and they went out of the country for about a year for work. Things were normal for the most part. The baby, at 6 to 12 months of age, would sometimes stare at the front door and cry, or point behind me when I was doing the dishes. Nothing too weird. My husband returned, and I eventually decided to remodel the house. It had not been updated since being built. It was a major undertaking. My youngest was probably two years at this point, and the oldest was six. I became convinced that our house was haunted at this point, and continued to be convinced for about two years. I had a dog who required medication twice daily. It would frequently go missing. I would find it later in the same spot I always kept it. One of my daughters would talk about the little boy that lived in the closet, and that she was afraid of him. So we moved the two girls into the same room because we felt they were lonely. This gave my husband a room to dedicate to his man cave and online PC gaming. My husband would talk about seeing a shadow dart back and forth in the hallway. I had a dream that when we took down the sheetrock, we found a secret room with dead twins who warned us to get out. All of this stuff seemed like normal occurrences that happen in life. But then, I finally became convinced that the house was haunted. My children and husband were all in bed. I had clean laundry, waiting to be folded on the chair. But then I decided to sprawl out on the couch and watch the breakfast club instead. Alone time was rare. All of a sudden, a shirt flew from the chair and hit me on the face. I ran to the bedroom and my husband was asleep. I woke him up 
and he voiced that he didn't believe me, but I know better because he got anxious and couldn't sleep. The next big event occurred when my youngest told me that there was a man in her bathroom. We had a security alarm, so I knew it couldn't be true. I had her take me to the bathroom and show me. She described him as black and pointed, then stated, He's right there. He's behind you. I told her we would just leave him alone and go about our day. We had other things that happened that we just explained away. I woke up to a shadow figure hovering over my husband. My dogs would wake up in the middle of the night and bark at the foot of the bed. I would hear noises coming from the kids' room and get a terrible feeling when I would check on them. I sometimes had to walk through a cold mist to get to their room. My dogs also would sometimes bark in the hallway. I finally called someone to intervene when my husband met me at the door, freaking out. I worked weekends and would always come home and tell him about my day while he played on his computer. The kids would be in bed by this time. I would then go shower and go to sleep. This night, my husband said I had already been home and had talked to him about my day. I then said I was going to go shower, so when he heard the garage door open and the car pull in, he immediately panicked. I was frightened to hear this as well, an entity taking my identity to make me feel helpless. A co-worker got me in contact with her friend who had special abilities. Her friend came over with another medium. They smudged our home and put crystals in the corners. It was all free. They told me that the limestone behind us held energy which attracts transient spirits and entities. Some are good and some are not. The shadow man stayed because of my husband's PTSD and was attracted to the negativity. They also said domestic abuse had previously occurred in the man cave at some point and that was a big focus of negative energy. They taught me to smudge and then told me I have ancestors by my side keeping me safe. Things would still happen on occasions after this. We spoke to our Muslim friends about it and they thought it sounded like a jinn. These creatures are mischievous and can be good or bad. They gave us a religious artifact from their hometown that had a prayer in Arabic carved into it. We kept it on top of our mantle and never had trouble after that. They would always laugh at Christmas time when we had our Christmas mantle decorations and our Muslim artifact. We have since moved, but we did spend a decade in that home. To give you some backstory, I live in an apartment attached to a funeral home. I'm a mortuary science student and I work for this funeral home to get experience while I'm in school so I can be a mortician. The funeral home happened to have a vacant apartment set privately in the back that I couldn't possibly turn down seeing as I moved away from home for this school and I needed somewhere inexpensive to live. Since the day I moved in, I've been having notable paranormal experiences. For a couple of months, I kept them to myself, not wanting to seem like I was feeding into some spooky funeral home stigma or making it up. But eventually, I was experiencing enough that I had to bring it up to a co-worker of mine. And she confirmed that she and a few other employees had seen and heard the things that I have. That being said, it's not news to any of us that this place is haunted, if that's what you want to call it. Now, under my story. Today, after I got home from class and went home, I was feeling extremely uneasy. My apartment felt extra dark and I felt sort of jumpy. I was standing in my bathroom braiding my hair and one of my co-workers texted me. She said she has a weird feeling and asks me to go check the front doors of the funeral home to make sure they are locked. I read her text as I braided my hair, and her next message pops up. I'm 99% sure I locked it, but I just have this feeling about something. I told her I'd go check. I finished braiding my hair and slipped on my shoes. I walked to the door in my apartment that opens up into the back of the funeral home. The lights are off, and I don't bother turning them on 
as the motion sensors in the hallway always kick on by themselves. I made my way to the front lobby, which was dark, not counting the light through the front door windows. I walked to the front doors and pushed. Sure enough, both unlocked. At that moment, I had a really heavy feeling, like someone was behind me or watching me. I kept turning around to look, but standing by the light of the doors and looking into the dark lobby made it almost impossible to see. I hurried up and locked the doors. I made my way back through the lobby. As I was about to enter the hallway, I hear a little girl giggling. I stopped dead in my tracks for a moment, just at the end of her giggling. It sounded like it was coming from behind a door, not six feet away from me. I got chills on my entire body and hightailed it back into the lit hallway and into my doorway. I locked the door behind me and immediately heard a loud bang from a room in the funeral home. I have no idea what it was, but it was loud, and I'm not about to go check. As I was standing there, shitting my pants, I texted my coworker back, saying the doors were both unlocked. And as I'm typing her my story of what happened, she says, I don't know man, I've been getting weird vibes in there all day. I think it's maybe safe to say, the spirits in here are extra active today. It had been a few weeks since I've had anything too strange happen, but now I'm extremely on edge. There are two spirits that myself, as well as three other co-workers have all seen. One is of a little girl. She looks maybe eight years old, she's slightly taller than average, and she shows herself so briefly you wonder if you ever saw it. I would almost say she looks ten, but when we hear her giggle, she sounds like a young girl of maybe six years old. The other is a tall, shadow-like man who wears a long black coat and a black hat. He's an entirely different story though, I'm chilled right now. Some days in here feel weirder than others, and tonight feels like the kind where I probably won't get any sleep. I feel so anxious right now. Usually these things happen in waves, so I feel like I'm just waiting for the next thing to happen. The day I moved in, I was trying to clean and dust everything as I unpacked. I was listening to music and polishing one of my end tables when something caught my eye. I glanced up towards my hallway where the bathroom is and briefly saw what looked like a little girl peeking at me from behind the door frame. I did a double take and she was gone. I paused my music and kind of stood there with a stupid look on my face I'm guessing. I heard a soft rustling noise from the bathroom like the sound of maybe a shower curtain. I walked over to the bathroom and peeked in, but of course, there was nothing there. My first few nights there were pretty normal, some strange noises like bumps on the wall, knocking, brushing noises. But I attributed it all to the fact that I was in a new place, and those noises were probably normal for the building. One night I was taking a shower, minding my own business when I felt an ice cold air on my back. I didn't have the air on this time and there are no windows in my bathroom that could easily cause a draft. I felt immediately uneasy and peeked out behind the shower curtain to see that everything was normal. I went back to showering and tried to pretend like nothing happened. As I was facing the water, my towel that was draped up over the curtain rod fell to the floor. I jumped and whipped around and quickly peeked behind the curtain again. Nothing. I was pretty shaken now and I picked up my towel and draped it back over the rod. I tried to hurry up and finish my shower. Just as I was about to turn off the water, I hear my bathroom door click. In absolute fear and panic and ready to nakedly fight someone, I ripped open the curtain to see my door slowly opening. I stood there and watched until it slowly reached the doorstop. I said something along the lines of, Oh my God. Through tears, I fumbled for my towel and ran out of the bathroom. I got dressed and left the house for the rest of the day. I didn't come back until nine at night. Nothing happened for the rest of that evening. After that, things were pretty quiet for a little while. Around two weeks later, it was a little after midnight and I was doing the laundry. My washer and dryer 
are in the actual prep room where we embalm people. So to do laundry, I'd have to go into the back hallway of the funeral home. I had just put a load on wash and was walking back to my apartment door at the very end of the hallway. Then I heard a door latch, kind of like the door was closed in the frame but not latched if that makes sense. It made me jump and I turned around, and at the end of the hallway, I saw the tall shadow man. Now, the owner of the funeral home was a big man who wears a long black coat in the winter and has this sort of cowboy hat thing he wears. So for a split second, I thought maybe it was my boss who'd come in for something, but it wasn't. It felt like a good two or three seconds that I watched him cross the end of the hallway and he just seemed to disappear into thin air almost as I was focusing on him. There are motion sensor lights in the hallway, and these lights were on during this encounter. He was tall and big. He had a hat on, similar to the one my boss wears, and was black top to bottom, like a really opaque shadow. Needless to say, I almost shit my pants. I bolted back into my apartment and locked the door. I was so scared and in so much disbelief, I was actually lightheaded and had to sit down. I still didn't mention him or the little girl I saw to anyone I work with. One day, when I came home from class, I noticed my microwave time had changed to military time. I didn't think anything of it, and I messed with the settings, switching it back. The next night, I was working, cleaning one of the lounges, and I noticed that the time on the microwave was also military time too. At that point, I honestly figured it was a power outage that happened in the day, and when the microwaves kicked back in, they just went wonky and switched into military time. This was until the next day, which was my day off. I slept in and lounged in my bed for like an hour, and one of my best friends called me. We'd been talking for about 20 minutes, and I was like, alright, I should probably get up and do something. I glanced over to see what time it was. My alarm clock was on military time. My alarm clock is cheap. It's a battery operated one and it doesn't even plug into the wall. I've had it for about four years and I've never seen it switch to military time. I went silent on the phone and stared at the clock, trying to find some sort of logical explanation. The microwave kind of made sense at first, but then with my alarm clock, I couldn't shake the feeling it meant something. Not long after this is when things got considerably spookier. Probably about three days later, I was coming back home one afternoon from classes when I came right in and threw my keys in my purse on the kitchen table and then turned my back to the table to plug the sink and start doing dishes. I was letting the sink fill and turned to get my keys and purse from the kitchen table and put them on the end table by my door, which is where I always place them so I don't forget them on a 3am death call. My purse was there, but my keys were not. I had just come in and thrown them on the table. It took a few seconds to get the sink ready, so they didn't get up and walk away in that short amount of time. Bewildered, I started looking under the table, on the floor, patting my pockets, trying to find my keys. I had just put them there. Frustrated, I go to plop down on my couch and ponder if I'm going crazy. Now I have a heavy quilt on my couch, and when I went to lift it and sit down, there were my keys. I didn't go anywhere near my couch when I came in. I am 100% positive I put my keys on the table next to my purse when I came in, and there was no reason they'd be under the quilt. But that wasn't the weirdest part. On my key ring, I have my parents' house key and my car key on the main key rings and a second key ring is attached to the one with my apartment door keys on it. The key ring with the apartment keys on it was stretched and bent, as if someone tried to rip the key ring straight off the other one. The key rings aren't flimsy bendy ones either. I could hardly open them enough to lock the key rings together when I put them on. It would have taken serious force to completely pull open the key ring like that. My stomach dropped through my asshole when I saw my keys there all messed up under the blanket. I almost didn't believe I was seeing it correctly. I felt a little crazy. At this point, I was feeling like I should at least vent to someone about what was going on. A night or two after that, I was working a visitation with an older woman who has worked for my boss for a long time. 
She's my favorite co-worker, as she's easy to talk to, and she reminds me of my grandma or something. Anyways, she asked me how I was settling into the apartment, and if I was enjoying it. I told her how much I loved my apartment, but that there were some weird things going on that don't make sense. She asked me what I meant, and I honestly didn't even want to say it. I didn't want her to think I was crazy or bullshitting her. After my hesitation, I just asked if she thought the funeral home was haunted. She explained to me that she had some strange experiences here as well, and a couple others I work with. They all heard loud screaming and moaning from time to time in the prep room. They heard giggling, unexplained doors opening and slamming, that kind of stuff. What upset me the most was that she told me about a tall man with a hat she had seen in the hallway a couple of times. At that point, I word vomited and told her everything that had happened since I moved in. That was the night that I felt like it was confirmed to me that there was something here. I sort of wanted to vomit. I was so scared. But at least I knew that I wasn't crazy. For a few weeks after that, nothing huge happened. I would always hear strange noises at night. It's not uncommon to hear a door open and close by itself somewhere in the funeral home. I've heard a few people talking, hear cots sliding around the floor, and the same moans and screams my coworker have all heard. This has become almost normal to me, so although it's freaky, it wasn't bothering me directly, and I could live with that. At least for a little while. Once again, Things picked back up one day when I was in my bedroom putting clothes away. I was sitting on my floor folding a mountain of laundry when I heard a loud, clear as day sound of a man clearing his throat in my living room. The kind of clearing that you do to get someone's attention. It was so clear and real that I didn't even think it was a ghost. I was confused for a moment, thinking maybe my boss had come in to speak to me. But surely he'd knock. Nobody would just walk in here. I hopped up and stepped into my living room. Nobody there. I peered around the corner to see if anyone was in my bathroom. No one. The realization that I was alone set in and my stomach sort of dropped. But honestly, I was so used to so much activity that after a few minutes of pacing around in disbelief, I shook it off and went back to folding laundry. In the most recent weeks, the most I've experienced are the normal sounds and voices and bumps in the night. One night, a couple random lights in my TV all shut off at once, unexpectedly. I had to go into the funeral home utility room to flip the switches in the breaker box. I notice that when I have someone over and start telling them about spirits, the lights or TV will shut off. A friend of mine has experienced this with me on three different occasions. Some nights it's nothing, and some nights I sleep with the blankets over my head. I'm a female, and at the time I was 22. This was my very first apartment, and I was so excited to be in it. My freshman year, I had lived on a dorm on campus. And before that, I just lived with my mom. So I'd never actually lived on my own before. The apartment was a two-bedroom, two-bathroom, and I had shared it with my friend, who I'd known since I was 13. His name was Josh. Josh was my absolute best friend, and it was his first year at university. So naturally, I was like, Oh my god, I'll show you around. And we pretty much did everything together. Fast forward to the homecoming football game. We attend a university that's crazy into football, and we're actually a pretty good team. So the homecoming game is a big deal to everyone. Josh was so excited to go out because it was his first homecoming game. He was going to go with this boy that he started flirting with, and he wanted me to come along. I don't really remember why I didn't want to go. I just didn't. Josh got mad at me. We said dumb stuff to each other and he left. So I was alone for the rest of the night. I had a small dog, Poppy, who lived with us, and I still have her to this day. She was around a year old at the time. We actually had a pretty relaxing night in the beginning. I took on a shower, put on face masks, 
and Poppy and I watched TV in bed. I remember listening to a song on repeat the entire day because that's what I do when I find a new song that I like. To this day, I still can't listen to it without being reminded. When we went to sleep around 10pm, I think, I wasn't keeping up with the football game so I really have no idea if it was just ending or whatever. But I knew not to expect Josh home early because he was going out with the guy he was seeing afterwards, Dylan. There is a strip of bars along one of the main roads running towards the campus and that's where they would be. That's where everyone would be after the game ended. I don't know what time it was, but I woke to the cabinets being slammed and really loud noises. It was really dark in my room, and the only thing I could see was that the kitchen lights were on. I saw the light coming through the bottom of the door. It sounded like people were going through our kitchen cabinets, one by one. Poppy was at the edge of the bed, barking like a crazy dog. I've never seen her act this way. I was struggling to keep myself awake, because I'm a really heavy sleeper. I just knew it wasn't Josh and Dylan, but some stupid part of me decided to call out, Hello? But it was weak sounding, and I really don't know if they heard me or not. Suddenly, my bedroom door opened, and I shot up. Poppy was snarling and trying to lunge at the stranger in my bedroom. I couldn't see anything, because the light from the open door was kind of blinding. I just saw his figure. He was wearing a hoodie and stood there for maybe 15 seconds, and I was just staring at him. This whole time, Poppy was trying to mess him up. He quickly closed my door, and I don't know why, I just didn't move. I wanted to move. Please move. Then my door flings open a second time, and we're staring face to face again. For the same, painfully long amount of time, my heart was racing, and I remember thinking, he's gonna hurt me. Now that I look back, I should have screamed or something. Poppy was at the very edge of my bed now, vicious and snarling. She sounded like a big dog, honestly, and then he slammed my door shut. As soon as he did, I jumped out of bed and locked my door. I heard them take my car keys. I was terrified they would find my car and steal it, since I had just parked directly outside. I frantically called 911 and was sobbing the whole time. I said, someone is in my house. They came in my room. Please, help. It took about 30 minutes for them to get there. I know there were cops everywhere surrounding the bars, since it was homecoming, which I live a five minute drive from. When I finally came out, the living room and my roommate's room were completely ransacked. My roommate's TV was on the floor because they tried to carry it out, but I guess they decided to just leave it. They stole my Xboxes and all my games. They stole my bag with all my textbooks and homework in it. The two policemen arrived, and I told them everything. I then asked if I could call my roommate. Josh picked up the phone, but was slurring heavily. I could tell that he was inside of a bar, and could barely hear me. I just screamed, please give Dylan the phone, hoping that Dylan was at least more sober than Josh was. So Josh put Dylan on the phone, and I don't know how, through my tears and sobs, and through the screaming people and house music, he heard me say that our apartment was robbed. He frantically said, we are coming, and hung up. They probably ran. While I was waiting for them, one of the policemen asked if he could try to take prints from my roommate's TV, and I agreed. He proceeds to then drop his flashlight directly on the screen, and it shattered. He just looked at me, and I'm like, really? So then Josh and Dylan get back. The police totally change their tone. They get aggressive and say we were targeted for a reason. I'm pretty sure that since it was homecoming, the robbers weren't expecting me to be there and were just trying to rob apartments blindly. We also live on the ground floor, so it's easier to get into. Josh is in the military, but Josh looks just like any other regular college freshman boy and his only friends at the time were basically me and Dylan, so we were the only ones who knew he was in the military. They tried to accuse Josh of stashing guns and drugs everywhere and that's why we got robbed. And I said to them, are you kidding me? They then tried to pull me to the side and say that Josh hired people to come rob his own apartment while I was inside. They asked me 
How do you know these guys? I said, Sir, I have known Josh since we were 13. We moved here together to attend university. He just gave me a look. When they left, we got our locks immediately changed, and then I had to take the next day off of school to drive to the nearest Nissan dealership. That was a 30 minute drive, and then I had to wait 7 hours for them to rewire a key fob for me. To the men who robbed me, let's not meet again, for your sake, because I'm older and angry. I have defensive weapons now, and I won't be afraid to kick your ass. And to the cops who accused my roommate of robbing his own apartment, I hope you got fired. Because yes, I did report both of you. A few years back, when I was 19, I just got my first apartment in the basement of an apartment complex. That might sound odd, but a friend's mother talked to the apartment's landlord to find me a cheap place to live. This was in Denver, so it wasn't cheap for a one-bedroom apartment in most places. This will be relevant later. The basement apartment was a studio located at the base of a flight of stairs. It was the only apartment at the bottom of the stairs. Between the apartment's boiler room and the laundry area, and even farther down a brick hallway with a screen door and landing before you finally got to my apartment door, the first few months of living alone were fine. There was a smoking area up the flight of stairs that led to my apartment. One day I was up there having a cigarette when a man sat next to me and also started smoking. He was a resident in the apartment. His name was John. John seemed mostly normal, maybe a little bit lonely, but nothing unnerving. He said that he lived alone and that he was an artist. We chatted until my cigarette was through. I said goodbye to John and went back downstairs. I would see John occasionally, smoking, as I was going to or coming from work. He always just said hi and never gave off any red flags, which makes this all the more creepy. One night when I was asleep, I woke up to the sound of my apartment doorknob jiggling. It was like someone was frantically trying to break the lock. I got out of bed and immediately grabbed a knife from the kitchenette. If this had been a normal room in the apartment complex, someone would have heard the doorknob rattling, but my apartment was secluded on the subterranean level. I stood right next to the jiggling doorknob and said, Hello? Who's there? No one answered. I looked through the peephole, but it was too dark to see. I said in a loud, confident voice, if you come in here, I will kill you. And I was serious about it too. Back then, I was pretty fearless and in a not so great mental state. The jiggling immediately stopped. Whoever it was booked it back through the screen door, down the hallway, and up the dark flight of stairs. I don't know if they thought I was asleep until then or what, but I think I scared them. I could see their dark outline go up the stairs through the peephole, but could not make out the person's features. I made a mistake that night when I decided not to call the cops. I feel like it would have been a hassle and that it was probably just some drunk person causing mischief. My heart was pounding from the adrenaline, but I felt confident I could take care of myself and mostly put the incident out of my mind. About a week later, late at night, Around 2 a.m., I woke up and realized the door to my apartment was wide open. I was in shock and couldn't really process what I was looking at. I walked towards the door, wondering how someone could have just come and left, making no sound. I remember my heart was beating furiously and it was difficult to breathe. Every footstep felt like I was walking further into fatal danger zone. I examined the door and the doorknob had been completely removed from its socket. I don't know how he broke the doorknob without waking me up. I have entertained many possibilities. Maybe he used a knife and carved it out. Maybe it wasn't fastened securely in the first place and it just kind of popped out on accident. But it held pretty sturdily when he was jiggling it the week before. I'm a fairly light sleeper, so I don't understand how he could have done that. It still bothers me to this day. 
there was a clean hole where the doorknob was attached to the door, and the doorknob was gone. I never did find it. The kitchen knife I had threatened the intruder with the week before was lying on the ground next to my bed. Maybe I got up and put it next to me in my sleep. I don't know. It's all a mystery to me, and that's why this occurrence still bothers me so much. I just can't figure it out. This person had been in my room, possibly watching me sleep, and they had left without doing anything. I'm lucky, I guess, but I'll never really know why. I bought a deadbolt for the door and had the doorknob replaced. Since people will probably ask, I didn't call the cops. Like I said, I was in a bad mental state and didn't really have a lot of energy to care about myself. But that's besides the point. I was really on edge for the next few weeks, but nothing happened until a few weeks later. When the guy tried to break in in broad daylight, he was doing his doorknob jiggling routine again, and I saw him this time. It was John, completely drunk. I know, because I yelled at him, and he scurried away, drunkenly back up the stairs like the first time. He was apparently known for having a drinking problem. After that time, the entire complex knew what he had done, and the owner of the building urged me to press charges. And, I believe, evicted John. I didn't press charges, however, for the aforementioned reasons. I moved out shortly after. Like I said, the unanswered questions still haunt me. What did he want? Was it him that broke in? Was it all just a nasty trick that my own mind played on itself? I'll never really know. In October 2007, my husband and I were in a really bad car accident. I sustained serious internal injuries, so I was physically a mess. I also don't have a lot of memories from that first year after the accident, but this one is really clear, being one of the few I have. Because we pretty much lost everything financially due to the accident, my husband took a job in Kuwait while I moved to Oklahoma City to be near my doctors. So it was pretty rough with my injuries, and we also had a seven-year-old daughter at the time, who was such a huge help to me, and she still is. So here I am, living in a city I'm not familiar with, with injuries to my body that I honestly shouldn't have survived, and I've got to be responsible for a seven-year-old girl. I asked my sister to come stay with me to help, and she did. After unpacking, she really became concerned with the fact that I had a sliding glass door and no way to brace it shut if anybody broke the lock. So she carted me off to Lowe's or Home Depot and brought a pipe and had them cut it to size. She made me keep the other half in my bedroom. This was a wise decision. After four weeks, my sister went back home and I was left to care for my daughter on my own again, while still a physical mess who needed more surgery, but at least my apartment was completely unpacked. The night this happened, I've got my little girl in bed asleep. Lights are off. I've taken my meds and I'm out cold. All of a sudden, I hear my best friend's voice yell in my ear, Get up. Keep in mind, my best friend lived in Virginia at the time and I was in Oklahoma. I was awake instantly, sat straight up in my bed, which was physically impossible for me at the time and immediately reached out and grabbed that pipe. I had that pipe in one hand and my phone in the other and started creeping down the hallway. I peeked in on my little girl, sound asleep. I eased her door shut. I continued on into my front room and that's when I heard it. Somebody was trying to get my front door open. I immediately called 911 and told them what was going on. I explained to the dispatcher that I was in no physical condition to fight someone off, but I would if I needed to. I then quietly eased up to my front door and peeked out the peephole. I recognized the guy. This guy used to wait for me to come out of my apartment with my daughter and walk into the parking lot by my car, and then he tried to talk to me. I had asked management to talk to him and ask him to stop. 
I made it clear several times that I was not interested and was married. I saw red. You dare try to break in my home with my child. I was going to kill him. I backed up and quietly told the operator who it was and that I was going to beat him to death. Rage and adrenaline are a hearty mixture. I admit it wasn't smart. I put my phone down, still connected, and proceeded to unlock and wrench that door open. At the time, I was swinging. You've never seen somebody move so fast. I saw him, but he bolted. I think in that split second of eye contact, he knew I was going to destroy him. The police never did come to my apartment that night. They sent security to the apartment complex instead. They caught the guy a few days later, when he finally came back to his apartment. I was informed by management that they evicted him. That was the last I heard on that. I'm still a bit pissed about it though. Shortly after, I had more surgery to finish repairing the damage to my body and moved to Georgia to be near my mom. This was last year, before my partner and I moved in together. For some background, my partner used to work very hectic shifts. Sometimes he'd finish at 5pm, sometimes 6pm, sometimes 9pm, and he would let me know if he'd be dropping by that day though he usually wouldn't be able to give me a time, but at least I knew he'd be coming by. It was around 8pm, and I was upstairs in the bedroom, working on an embroidery project. I had my airpods in, so I wasn't too aware of what was going on around me. I remember feeling the bed rattle, since my bedroom was right above the front door, so whenever someone closed the door, seeing as it was very old and heavy, it always rattled my bed frame. This would usually indicate my partner has arrived. I didn't immediately go downstairs to greet him, as I really wanted to finish this piece of embroidery off that I was working on. It was about five minutes before I took my airpods out, and proceeded to make my way out of my bedroom and onto the stair landing. I was about to call out for him, when I realized he didn't leave his work jacket or work boots in the entry. He knew full well I didn't like shoes, especially work boots, all over my carpeted floors. I assumed I must have imagined feeling the bed shake. I went back into my bedroom and was about to put my airpods back in when I very distinctly heard a big crash coming from downstairs. It sounded like something very heavy was dropped. I freaked out and called my boyfriend's name from the bedroom doorway. I got no reply but I sure as hell started hearing heavy footsteps pacing towards the entryway. My gut feeling was that something was very wrong. I turned and grabbed my phone from the bed and I bolted to the bathroom, which was the only room in the house with a lock. I called the police as I started hearing the same noise, heavy footsteps making their way upstairs. I've never ever been scared of those creaking sounds coming from the stairs, but it was different then, at the time. I felt as if I've never heard a scarier sound. As I was on the phone to the police, the only thing I could tell the lady on the phone was my address, over and over again. I was more focused on how I was going to get out of there. I wasn't going to wait and see what would happen, or who this person was so I flung open my small bathroom window and slid feet first down onto the lower roof. My adrenaline was so high, I had to momentarily put my phone into my bra, seeing as I had no pockets and needed both of my hands. I just remember hearing the police dispatcher keep asking over and over if I'm okay and what was happening. I didn't even have time to tell her what I was doing. It felt as though my body had gone onto autopilot. Once on the bottom roof, I lowered myself again, now onto the pavement. As I fell, right onto my knees no less, I got right up and bolted it down the street. It was completely dark, with it being mid-October. The dispatcher was still on the phone when I finally got on it again. And I told her, whilst running, that there was someone in my home and how I just jumped out of the window to get away. I ran for what felt like forever 
until the lady on the phone said to focus on finding a shop where I could go into and wait for the police. I remembered my boyfriend and told the lady I needed to call him. I made it to a Tesco Express by then, and though she wanted to keep me on the phone, I said that I needed to make sure that my partner didn't go into my home and potentially risk running into that person. I got in contact with my partner, who had just finished work and was driving to my house. I told him what happened, and he instead started heading towards the shop I was outside of. I felt such a relief when he got here. I remember taking a picture of my scratched up knees when I got in the car. For some reason, I got very fixated on them. My partner called the police back for me as the shock started setting in then, and he let them know he was with me. It took some time before the police finally arrived at my home. I was told my front door was left wide open, and in the living room, the side table had been knocked over. My home wasn't ransacked, but it did look as though someone booked it out of there relatively quickly. Upstairs, my bathroom door was kicked in so hard that the door frame itself was indented, though nothing was stolen. Once they looked over my place, I was called and told I could return. A call-out ambulance crew was called, and they looked over me. They sorted out my knees, and then they did some sort of assessment to see if I was okay mentally. They told me to go see my general practitioner the next morning about my knees. Reports and statements were written up. I stayed with my boyfriend for two weeks after that. I had to hire someone to fix my door frame, along with having a security system installed, as I don't think I'd be able to return without it. They never found out who this man was. My neighbors had cameras, and all we ever figured out about this person was that he was a man who just walked right into my home like it was his. Zero hesitation. My front door was unlocked as I was expecting my partner. I live in a very safe village, and leaving the door unlocked was a common occurrence. Though, I've never left it unlocked since. I still live here, with my partner and two dogs now. The man has never been back, though. We have quite obvious cameras around the property, along with visible security company signage. This was easily the most terrifying experience I've had in my life. It's so hard to describe or tell people. It's like I wasn't in control of my own body when this was happening. Autopilot went on, and all I knew was I needed to get out of there. I live in a small rural community in eastern US. It's a nice little town. Because of my work in the medical field, I've met some interesting folks. I am also familiar with law enforcement and emergency personnel. Small town life is not as dull and uneventful as people think, especially since everybody knows somebody who knows somebody. I have a lot of stories to share, but this one just happened. I'll start here. Because it's very recent and the investigation is ongoing, I have to be vague with some of the details, but I needed to tell someone. I'm single and live alone. Due to a stalker, I've moved twice, but that's a story for another time. However, it is relevant for this story for multiple reasons. The first being that I have a dog for the sake of protection as well as motion sensors and outdoor security cameras. The second reason being the location of my home, which is literally down the street from a fire department and a couple of blocks from a police station. However, next to the fire department is the road department, which is basically a parking lot where they park the road equipment and empty garbage trucks at night and on weekends. Oddly, it does have security cameras, Small town life, I suppose. My house sits on a hill with a good view of that side street. Due to the incline, the large trees in the front yard, and the half cornfield on the property next to me, most people on the street below wouldn't notice me in the backyard, unless they were actively looking. However, I can see the street clearly. This incident happened Saturday evening. The county was holding its annual Independence Day spiel with a community barbecue 
music, fireworks, and all that jazz. I didn't attend because it's not my thing, plus I have a dog, and the sound of fireworks can be traumatizing. Before the big show, I took the dog out to relieve herself in the backyard. There was still at least an hour of daylight, but the entire neighborhood was pretty quiet because most people were either at the fairgrounds or various other holiday events. So when an unfamiliar, large, white pickup truck drove slowly down the street, I noticed. It must have turned around at the end of the street because I saw it again, moving in the opposite direction. Only about 20 seconds later, this time it turned into the parking lot of the road department. Now, People have been known to toss things into empty garbage trucks because they don't want to or are unable to make the trip to the landfill themselves. Usually, it's things like furniture or broken equipment, but I didn't see any of those things in the back of this truck. The driver was a somewhat stocky guy of average height. He took three large black trash bags from the bed of his truck and tossed them one by one into the hopper of the garbage truck. Then he left. Now, I swear, I'm not one of those meddling rear window types who always thinks activity is suspicious and that their neighbors are up to no good, but something about this didn't sit right with me. Normally, when I see people tossing their garbage into trucks and leaving, I don't bother reporting it because it's relatively harmless. But this time, I had a gut feeling so I called the police. If anything, they could get the guy for illegally dumping trash from a barbecue or whatever. While I'm on the phone with dispatch, I put my dog inside to cut down on distractions while the officers investigate. A few minutes later, an officer arrived and I crossed the street to meet him, gave him a description of the events, and then pointed out which of the trucks that the man had tossed the bags into. He found the bags, he took photos, he put on gloves and told me to stay back. The bags were tied in a knot at the top and it took him a minute to untie them because of his gloves and how tight the knot was. But eventually he got it open, looked inside for a few seconds, then twisted it closed and took a few steps back. Shit, he hissed under his breath. What? I asked. It's a body. I felt sick. I could tell he felt sick too. I saw him grow pale. His hand was trembling when he held the radio. Even his voice was shaking as he gave the code to dispatch. The dispatcher sounded confused when she asked him to repeat it. Within 10 minutes, the county sheriff was on scene. Even he looked sick at the contents of the bag. The coroner arrived about 10 minutes after that and the first officer walked me back to the house, along with another one who arrived at the same time as the coroner. Though I showed the first cop via the app on my phone when I described the events initially, I now showed them the video on a larger screen. The camera caught the footage of the truck as it drove by both times, as well as pulling into the parking lot. Though unfortunately, no clear view of the license plate or of the man tossing the bags out of frame. We watched the footage over and over, pausing frames, the officers taking notes. Ultimately, they requested this footage as well as a copy of the files from the past week to see if the truck had been in the area before. I've also been saving footage until the road department installs their own cameras this week. Because this is still fresh, I don't know many more details. I know that the body was in pieces, but I don't know the age of the victim the gender, the cause of death, any of that. Information hasn't been released to the public. I don't even know if the coroner has been able to identify the body yet. A police cruiser has been parked at the fire department next door for constant surveillance, in case the guy comes back. The guy who dumped the body was likely a local. How else would he have known he could dump it there? He probably thought it would get buried in other people's illegal trash accumulated over the holiday weekend and the sanitation crew wouldn't have bothered to investigate. When I think about how this guy lives in my community, 
it makes me feel physically ill to think that he had clearly scouted the area for a dump site, that it may not have been the first time this had happened, that this could happen again. If I hadn't called it in, if I hadn't been in the backyard at that exact moment, or if I ignored that gut feeling, the victim would never have been found, may never find potential justice, their loved ones may never have closure. In fact, there is a possibility that it might just happen again to another poor soul. I hope it's not me. Dear God, please, don't let it be me. I think it's time I moved again. Third time's the charm, right? I had blocked this story from my memory until my girlfriend reminded me a couple of days ago. I started dating my girlfriend at the end of my senior year and before we started dating, I used multiple dating apps. In many of my dating app profiles, I had listed my Snapchat so people could add me. This is important. Nothing led to anything with the dating apps. I talked to people for a bit and eventually the conversation would die out. When I began dating my girlfriend, I had deleted the apps but never deleted my account, meaning people could still see my profile and my Snapchat in it. I realized this after a few people added me, but it didn't go anywhere because I tell them I had a girlfriend. As you would imagine, the conversation would end there. There was this one guy that added me. We'll call him Adam and he asked me if I was available. I was used to guys adding me, but being straight, I gave him the usual response. Sorry, I'm straight and I have a girlfriend. I expected him to leave me alone, but he didn't. At first, the messages were normal. How was your day? What did you do today? Simple stuff like that. Being the nice guy I am, I responded because I thought this guy just wanted to be friends. Then, the messages progressively got more creepy. He started asking questions about my girlfriend, and not like the basic questions. Questions like, do you guys have sex a lot? Or, does she think you're good in bed? I simply responded with, those are kind of personal questions, and I don't feel like it's right for me to share my dating business. Adam would always apologize and not talk to me for a few days. Then he would hit me up again and start asking creepy questions again. I eventually told my girlfriend about the situation. And for those who don't know, my girlfriend is super sweet, but she's also very aggressively protective over me. So she adds the guy and basically tells him that he needs to leave me alone. Unfortunately, this enraged Adam, who responded saying that I need to dump this bitch now. Naturally, I defend my girlfriend and block Adam. Everything was cool for a week until another account added me. The guy's name was Tyler and he was super chill. He was really nice to me and respected my relationship with my girlfriend. As the days go by, I start to notice that Tyler's vocabulary was very similar to Adam's. I wasn't sure about it, so I didn't make any assumptions that it was him so I gave Tyler's snap to my girlfriend, who adds him to investigate. As soon as she adds Tyler's snap, Tyler flips out on her, which confirmed to me that it was Adam. As soon as the realization is made, I block him again. From here, everything goes quiet from Adam for about a month. So I live in the suburbs of Chicago, and both my girlfriend and I live down the street from each other. So naturally, we do see each other a lot and both our families are really good friends. On top of that, our families would house sit or pet sit for each other. Anyway, a month goes by until I get a letter with no address or name on it, just my name on the front. I open it, and to my shock and horror, it's basically a love letter from Adam. The premise of the letter was basically him saying that he loves me and he wants me to run off with him. The letter also takes a very sexual turn halfway through. At this moment, two horrifying realizations hit me. One is that he knows my address. And two, 
he dropped the letter off himself, meaning that he is in town. I immediately call my girlfriend, who is equally as shocked as I am, and after consulting with my parents, we call the cops. Unfortunately, since I had blocked as well as removed Adam's social media information, and the letter had no return address, there was nothing we could do about it. Day after day, letters would keep appearing in my mailbox, until they also started appearing in my girlfriend's mailbox as well. Her letters were far worse than mine. Adam wrote of how much he hated her, and how much he wanted to hurt her. He also stated many times of all the different ways he would inflict pain on her, until she broke up with me. Like me, she took this to the cops, and again, they could do nothing about it. My girlfriend's family had plans to go to Hawaii for a vacation, and I was to house it for them. The first couple of days went fine, until around one of the last nights of the week. As per usual, I was over at their house, watching TV on the couch, when the power went out. Mind you, it was around 1am, and it was pitch black when the lights went out. The next few seconds were silent, and then I heard a window smash from the office. To understand this more, let me give you the layout of the house. When you entered from the front door, to your left was the living room. Straight ahead was both the kitchen and the stairs. And to the right was the office and dining room. On the upstairs level, as soon as you reached the top of the stairs, a bathroom was straight ahead. My girlfriend's room was on the right, and the other bedrooms were on the left. Immediately I shot up and grabbed a kitchen knife. I ran upstairs to hide while I called the cops. I quickly got into my girlfriend's room and slipped into the closet. As soon as I was able to contact the operator, I heard the pounding of the intruder running up the stairs. Thankfully, I had relayed all the information to the operator in time, who then stayed on the phone as we both remained quiet. The intruder took a left when he reached the top of the stairs, which gave more time for the cops to arrive and for me to get ready just in case I needed to defend myself. A few minutes go by until I heard the intruder start walking towards my girlfriend's room. In the only few precious seconds I had, I slipped out of the closet and positioned myself next to the door. As soon as he had opened the door and started to enter the room, I took the kitchen knife and drove it into his shoulder. A young man screamed in pain as I heard a heavy metallic object make a thud as it hit the ground. From there, I bolted out of the house where I was met with four squad cars and cops with their guns raised. I threw my hands up, shouting that he was upstairs in the right room. A few minutes go by and the intruder was dragged out, still screaming in pain. With the siren's lights flooding the streets, I got a glimpse of his face. It was Adam and I was informed later by an officer that metallic thud was made by him dropping a handgun. Adam was from Texas, and had traveled up to my state to be with me. He had rented a room at a local motel, and would put letters in both my girlfriend's and my mailbox daily. He would do this in the early hours of the morning, which was confirmed by the security footage of the motel. That night, Adam had plans to kill my girlfriend and her family, so I would choose to be with him. He managed to pry open the power box to switch off the power to her house along with the neighboring houses. He broke in with the intent of her being there. Well, unfortunately for him, she was enjoying a tropical vacation. To be honest, I have no idea how this outcome would have been different if they didn't go on vacation, and I am grateful that I still have my girlfriend as well as her family alive. So Adam, Please, stay the fuck away from my girlfriend and me. My very first car was a dark green 2000s Volkswagen Jetta. It was the most basic of basics when it came to cars. No options whatsoever, except for an automatic transmission. It was $300. Slow, dumpy, no right headlight, 
drove straight with the steering wheel practically sideways and let out a cloud of white smoke when it started. Every stereotype of a poor high schooler's car you can think of. My car was no exception. Despite it being a piece of crap, I loved that car. I drove it every chance I had. I don't think a day went by that I didn't drive it. I named it Thunder Bunny. She was my baby. My beautiful green baby. But Volkswagens from that generation, Jettas especially, had a pretty bad flaw in the automatic transmission. I'm not sure exactly what causes it, but essentially, the transmissions gradually get worse and worse until the car won't shift into third gear, and there's not a thing you can do from there. So, a couple of weeks after Halloween 2019, I was going about 30 miles per hour when the engine suddenly roared and the car wouldn't speed up. I feared the worst, and my fears were justified. My dad, a mechanic, didn't even have a hope for my baby. She was gone already. And so, much to my dismay, we started looking for a new car. It only took about a month for us to find her. A dark green 1999 Volkswagen Jetta. Exactly like my old car, but everything was better. She was faster had heated leather seats, automatic windows, an automatic sunroof, everything. All except for an automatic transmission. I knew how to drive a manual, so it was perfect. I had a new baby. I went from the crackhead neighbor girl to Scarlett Johansson, at least in my eyes. I loved that car even harder. I named it Little Boy and was happy. The thing about manual cars is that you can't leave it in gear and take your foot off the clutch. If you do, the car will stall, which is bad. So if you do leave the car in gear, you need to turn the engine off before taking your foot off the clutch. If you don't want to turn the car off or have it turn itself off, you need to pull the handbrake or it'll roll away. Guess what the only broken thing on my car was? If you guessed the handbrake, you were right. Okay, now on to the story. I started working as a pizza delivery driver in a smaller, growing town inside of Michigan. It was good money, but every once in a while, I delivered to an incredibly sketchy place. I've had a few shotguns pulled on me. One night, about two months ago, I was delivery on a Friday. Usually Fridays are pretty busy, but this day was a little slow. So when a delivery came in at 8.30, a half an hour before we closed, I jumped on it. I realized it was 7.1 miles away, so all of the closing jobs would be done by the time I got back, and I would have been able to leave immediately. It was way out of town, in a wood surrounded neighborhood, but again, no work when I got back to the store. That seemed like a good deal to me, and I'm all about those sort of deals. And so... I climbed into my car and went to drive 7.1 miles away. As I pulled up to the house, I began to get a bad feeling. The house was in a small trailer park type of neighborhood, next to a lake, the kind that the houses are all a good distance apart, with a likely drug problem, and it was completely dark. No lights outside, and none inside. There was a single car in the driveway and an open window on the side of the house. I pulled in behind the car in the driveway and sat there for a moment. Something was off. By the house being completely dark, I mean there wasn't so much as a nightlight that I could see. Usually when I deliver to a dark house, there's at least a light on the upstairs or something that would signal someone being awake, waiting for their pizza. But the house seemed dead. Nevertheless, I put my car in gear, turned off the engine, grabbed the small, cheapest pizza we had, and got out. Without my headlights on, there was nothing. I could barely see the house. The only light was the dim moon. I walked onto the porch and passed the big open window to the front door. As I reached the front door, I saw it. The door was slightly cracked open just enough for me to see into the void of the house. 
Thinking of every single horror movie I've seen, I said aloud, screw that, and I hurried back to my car. I'm a tall, well-built looking guy, but despite my wide shoulders and baggy hoodie, I'm a frail thing, and I can hardly fight off a small dog. I got into my car and turned the engine on. My headlights illuminated the house, and almost simultaneously, the living room light behind the big open window lit up and a single guy looked out and walked to the front door. I cussed to myself and weighed my options. If I went to the door, I could die. If I noped out of there, I would 110% be fined. That meant no new car part, no gas money, no cute dates with my girl, just sitting at home doing virtual schoolwork. It was a stupid choice, I know but I grabbed the pizza and opened my door. Making a choice I'm damn glad I made, I took the car out of gear and climbed out. Mostly so my engine would still be running, so that if I needed, I could run back and immediately take off. I walked to the door, where the man had opened it the rest of the way. As I got closer, I got a good look at him. I'm not one to judge a person based on their physical appearance, but this guy's head was cleanly shaven and was covered in tattoos. He was wearing a pair of grey jeans and a white tank top. He had a scowl on his face and was staring me dead in the eyes. I looked past him for a moment into the house, which was completely empty. As I got close enough that I started opening the pizza bag, he started to reach around his waist. I stopped. He was staring at me with the most evil grin I've ever seen. I knew in that moment that I was about to die. I had always heard your life seems to flash before your eyes. I thought about my girl, that she wouldn't know what happened. My work would stop delivering upon my disappearance, assuming that my body wasn't ever found. My dad would regret telling me that he was happy for me landing this job. God save thee. That's when I heard it, the distinct sound of gravel under tires. My only pathetically small chance of escape was rolling away. I didn't even look back at the car to know that. I just stared at the man and was about to say, fuck you, when he looked back to my car. I heard the sound of the car rolling. It was getting closer. The guy's eyes went from the driveway to behind me. I finally looked over my shoulder. My car had rolled backwards and had come to a stop near the mailbox of the house. I looked back at the guy, who had a nervous look. He looked back at me and scowled again, and he took his hand from around his waist. He reached into his front pocket and took out $12 and handed it to me. I gave him the pizza and watched him slam the door shut. I ran back to my car and practically tore the door off trying to get in. I looked back at the house, and the man was standing in the front of the window, staring out at me. You better believe I nearly spun the tires on my way out of there. I kept glancing at my mirrors until I started driving under the street lights. It was easily the scariest encounter I've ever had. As soon as I got back to the store, I told my boss all about it and she called the police. We never heard anything about it. I assumed they went to the house and only found a small cheese pizza. I started carrying a knife on me at all times and my boss is considering getting trackers for our pizza bags. Only recently, I've realized this sort of butterfly effect. I thought it was the worst thing ever that my transmission went out, and I cursed Volkswagen for designing such a terrible automatic transmission. But if that transmission was still working, then I would have still had that car when this happened. I would have put the car in park, and it would have sat there while whatever happened to me happened. I have zero doubts in my mind that this man was planning on murdering me. So, shitty engineering saved me from getting murdered. This happened when I was in high school. My mom just recently found the paperwork about it when she cleared it out of her office upon retiring from the police department. I remember being upset and scared when it happened, 
but reading the details as an adult, it sounded even worse than I remembered. I'm a female, and at the time I was 17. I was working at a flower and gift shop. It's night time, a man comes in, short, overweight, balding, 40s, creepy. He tells me about how he needs an apology gift for his girlfriend, so I offer a bouquet. Obviously, it's a flower shop. He says she doesn't like flowers because they die. This was the first weird thing, as he came into her flower shop. Then, he goes into detail about how he hit her, and asks me if I think he was right to do so. This was long ago, so I don't remember exactly what I said, but I said something along the lines of, not if you wanted to continue being your girlfriend. He then tells me what a great job I'm doing, and asks when I get off of work. I dodge answering, and he leaves. Nothing more for six months. Then right before Valentine's Day, he walks in the door one minute before we close. It was dark, and from the outside, it looked like I was working alone, as my co-worker was in the bathroom. Instinctively, it felt like a predator had just entered the room. You know when something isn't right. Everything felt not right. I then noticed he has a tarnished revolver tucked into the front of his windbreaker, which is halfway unzipped. It was obvious he wanted it seen. I quickly scribble a note to my co-worker that said, he has a gun. I handed it to her when she came out of the bathroom. She calmly walked over to the phone and looked at me, wordlessly asking if she should call the cops. I shook my head no, as I felt it would escalate the situation. God forbid he heard the police coming and took us as hostages or something. I was just going to try to act as calm and normal as I could and hopefully not tip the situation into something more dangerous. He spends 15 minutes wandering around what was a fairly small shop. In retrospect, he was probably wanting to see if my co-worker would leave as it was now well past closing. Finally, he places an order for pickup on Valentine's Day and he gives me his name and information for the police report I'm sure is hell about to file. He buys a card, pulls out a wad of $100 bills, which he slowly thumbs through, as though looking for the right one with which to pay for his $40 order. I ask him if he wants a bag, as it wouldn't be very inconspicuous if he just showed up at home with a Valentine's card. He replies, No, I don't feel like being inconspicuous tonight which seemed like an obvious reference to the gun hanging out of his coat. He leaves. We quickly lock the door and watch him sit in his truck outside. We were not about to exit the shop until he was gone. Finally, he pulls out of his parking spot and proceeds to move to another spot, further away, and just continues to sit there. I don't know how long we waited, but he finally left. I called my mom, crying. She called the police, who came to the shop the next day to take a report. I told my best friend at the time what happened. She told her mother. Her mother happened to work with the man and informed security at her job. She said he was very weird, creepy, and liked to talk about weapons a lot. Security at his job pulled him into the office and questioned him about it. He claimed it was a glove in his pocket, not a revolver. The police were pissed that his company made contact with him about it before they did, and he successfully dodged the cops' multiple calls and visits to his apartment. My mom, much to my teen fury at the time, made me quit my job, which was devastating as I loved it there. In retrospect, totally the right call. The dude came in on Valentine's Day and picked up his order. I never saw him again. This happened on a Saturday night. I was going out to a bar, almost 20 minutes away from my home, and called for an Uber. I have been using Uber for at least two years now, and I've never had an experience like this one. Also, it is very unusual that I need a ride to somewhere so far away from my home. But this is where the show I wanted to see was. For context, I'm a 26-year-old female, and I very frequently go out by myself. So, 
I take my pre-game shots and wait for the car to arrive. I am smart enough to always verify the plate number and the make and model of the car, along with always riding in the back seat, thank goodness. I get into this guy's car, and at first, things are normal. His accent was a little thick, so some of what he said was hard to understand, but the fact is relevant to the story. He asks where I'm going, and I tell him that my friend is performing at this bar that I've never been to. In hindsight, I probably shouldn't have mentioned that to him. Then I say something like, yeah, I don't get out much. He responds to me, saying, oh yeah, I'm the same way. I like to stay in, and I don't make commitments, because I don't know how I'm going to feel the day off. At least, that's what I thought he said. So I respond with, yeah, me too. He gets really excited about this, and starts going on about physical and sexual relationships. At this moment, I finally start paying attention to where he is driving. Yes, I did not know the exact location of this bar, but I had a general idea, and I knew what side of the city it was on, in reference to my home. I realize this driver is going the complete opposite direction he was supposed to, and he's ignoring his navigation. I'm panicking, and I'm too scared to say something, in fear that it may escalate the situation. His comments are getting creepier by the minute, and I'm trying to form a plan. He's saying, you know, you're a lot like me, and I've never met anyone like me before. If I wasn't working, I would ask you out right away. Would you be interested? I tell him no, I don't think that's appropriate, but he just keeps repeating himself. I'm completely sobered up in fear at this moment, and finally, the words of advice from my dear friend from last time I had a creepy encounter, pops in my head. Always tell someone where you're going, and when you expect to get there. That was the aha moment. I text my brother Jim the situation, give him the address of the bar I was trying to get to, and send him a screenshot of this creep's info on his Uber profile. I also tell Jim that if he doesn't hear from me in 15 minutes, to send out a search party. Thank my lucky stars that my brother responded right away. And at this very same moment, the driver starts heading in the right direction. Jim also has me on Facebook Messenger, so I can share my location with him. Such a lifesaver technology can be. The Uber driver tries one more time to ask me out. Again, I tell him it's inappropriate. I wanted to say more, but I didn't want to piss this guy off while I'm still in the car. He finally takes the hint and shuts up. After a few more minutes of tense, scared silence, I arrive at my destination. The driver tries to apologize, and I'm like, Okay, bye. My friend was standing outside, so I make a beeline for her. We then proceed to get drunk, and have a grand old time the rest of the night. I reported this driver the next day. Within hours, I get a response from Uber customer service, refunding me my whole fare and telling me that they're going to look into the driver. This whole situation could have ended horribly, and I am grateful it did not. Obviously. Hopefully my story can be helpful to someone else if they end up in a similar situation. I'm not going to stop using Uber, but I will certainly pay much closer attention to what the driver is doing. Also, be sure you leave the house with a fully charged phone if you're going to go out alone. Stay safe out there. One night, my boyfriend and I were out drinking and hanging out with our friends. We went back to our friend's apartment that lived about 10 to 15 minutes away in the next town over. It was getting pretty late and we both had work the next day, so we called an Uber to pick us up. So our Uber gets there, everything is fine, we make casual small talk as you usually do in Ubers or lifts. The vibe was fine, the dude seemed nice enough. Nothing to worry about. I was just exhausted and wanted to go home. Then I remember feeling wide awake out of nowhere. We get to the end of the street, and I recognize it as being closest to our homes. And while I'm really bad at directions, this was a turn where you turn right. You're going towards our homes. You turn left. You're clearly driving in the opposite direction. The guy gets to the stoplight. 
and flicks his left blinker on. I immediately start looking around and to my boyfriend, who's clearly on edge. My boyfriend asks the driver where he's going, because this is clearly the wrong way, and he tells my boyfriend not to worry, that he's from the area and he knows a shortcut. Whatever. We both relax a bit, especially because this was a main road, and there was plenty of side streets around that he could have been cutting through. Then he gets to another stoplight, and has the ability to either make a right, which would put him going towards the general direction of where we lived, or left, which was going in the direction of the next town over. He flinks his left blinker on, and at this point, I notice that he has the Uber apps and GPS tracking totally off. His entire phone is off, so there's nothing tracking his driving or location, and he's not being monitored by the app. My heart starts beating, and I get out my phone to call 911. I pull out my car keys, because I have this shiv-like stabby weapon thing attached to a keychain. My boyfriend flies out of his seat, and lunges towards the front seat, so that he's half standing up, and starts yelling at the guy, asking where we're going because we know this was a wrong way. The guy immediately flicks his right blinker on instead, and skirts into the right lane instead of left, where we had previously been. He says sorry over and over again, and my boyfriend says, you know what, never mind. We're gonna get out right here. This is fine. Please unlock the doors. When he went to unlock the doors, the driver freaked out. He got really defensive and on edge, and he said, no. I'm sorry, I promise I'll take you home now. I'm going the right way now. I'm so sorry, buddy, I got you. Almost admitting that he was taking us in the wrong direction. I can't remember if he rode the rest of the way in that Uber, because there were likely no other ones around at that hour, and we felt like we called the guy out enough that he wouldn't do anything, and I'm not sure if we actually got out of the car and began to walk home. Like I said, very exhausting drunk night. The most chilling parts about this for me was how he had his app off and how he was so quick to correct himself as soon as we noticed. Like he didn't even try to come up with a cover story to justify his actions. He admitted that my boyfriend freaked him out. He was not taking us to our destination. We reported that guy the next day on the Uber app and have never come in contact with him since. I don't know what he was planning, but I pray to whoever is up there that he didn't have the opportunity to scare anyone else like this ever again. A couple of years back, I was without a car, and I lived in what we consider the downtown area of Pensacola, Florida. Being that I didn't have a car, I frequently Ubered to and from work, and sometimes from bars downtown if it was late, and I felt unsafe as a small lesbian walking home. Our town doesn't have a lot of hate crimes, but more like unwelcome confrontations from religious people and just ignorant people. I never really had a problem with any of my Uber drivers, until I met James. James was, I assume, from somewhere else, because his English wasn't as good. He had picked me up to take me to work a few times, but I had a hard time understanding him, so our conversations were short and confusing. One of the times instead of talking, he sang to me the name game. I have an unusual name, but it rhymes with Bailey, Haley, Kaylee, etc. So, that happened. It was okay, kind of funny, but it lasted the whole 20 minute ride home. So I got weird and didn't know what to say after a while. Fast forward to a few months later, I had drank a few beers at a local dive bar and it was time to walk home. I realized I was probably too drunk to walk, cause who knows where my drunk mind would have let me wander off to, so I called an Uber. Well, it was James. He recognized me. I climb in the car, and we proceed to my house. I was only maybe two miles away from my house, so not a bad walk during the day, but the night, nah. Well, James decides that, instead of going home, he wants to stop by and buy me a Whataburger, cause I need food before I go home. Sweet, right? So instead, he drives towards Whataburger. 
At that point, I'm still cool and happy with what's happening. Well, here comes Whataburger, and he drives past. I said to him, Hey, that was it. He said, Yeah, I know, but I forgot my wallet at my house, so we're gonna go there first. That's when I start to sober up, and tell him no, just take me home. Well, he doesn't stop at first. He argues that I should be nicer if he's doing me a favor, so I get a little more vocal. After, he says fine, I'll turn around, and said something in another language that I can only assume is bitch or whatever. I felt like I couldn't wait, so I hopped out at a red light and just braved the walk home which would have only been two miles, but now it's like four miles because I'm down by the Whataburger. End of the story. I did make it home safe, but sadly on my way home, the police stopped and searched me because I was out so late in what they considered a bad neighborhood. They didn't care about the weird driver because nothing happened. So yeah, sort of creepy to me. This happened to me a few years ago. It was New Year's Eve, and I had just been out in the city to celebrate with three of my closest girlfriends. At the end of the evening, when we were all exhausted and ready for bed, one of our friends traveled to our house near the club, while the others made the hour-long trek back to our home suburb. There were three of us together, all females. The trip to our suburb typically involved a 45-minute long bus trip, and then an Uber or taxi to our houses. I have lived in this area my entire life, and I am very familiar with the most convenient way to get to and from my house. On this particular evening, we got off the bus, and I booked an Uber with my phone. It was around 4am, so you can imagine our remote town had very little road traffic this time. A car pulls up at the bus stop, as this was the first car we had seen since arriving and no one else was around except us. We assumed it was our ride and got in. Our Uber driver was a Russian man with a very thick accent, although he didn't speak a lot. Immediately, I noticed he was taking us in the wrong direction of my house, but I figured it's fine. Sometimes GPSs take drivers on different routes. I brushed off the thought. Then, 10 minutes later, I get a text message that my Uber driver is arriving at my pickup destination. I looked at the driver beside me, angry that I was too tired or intoxicated to remember the text message you received before your ride pulls up, but also terrified that I may have gotten my two best friends and myself into a vehicle with a man we didn't know at all. My actual Uber driver then tried to call me, presumably to find out where we were, but I ignored the call, not wanting to alert the man who had picked us up. At that point, I still hadn't said anything to my best friends, but I asked the driver if he will stop at a service station so I can grab a drink of water before we continue the journey because I said I felt sick. He questioned me, we aren't far from your destination now, but I insisted, so he agreed. When we arrived at the service station, I asked my friends to get out with me, desperately, and they obliged. I explained the situation to them, and we all agreed to tell the driver that we were going to walk to a friend's house nearby, and not to worry about the rest of the trip. He seemed frustrated, and insisted he take us, but we refused to get back in the car. We ended up getting a cab back home from there. This happened back in 2019 when I was living in a small town in western Massachusetts. I had bought concert tickets for one of my favorite metal bands. They were performing at the Palladium on a September afternoon. I worked in a town 45 minutes away from where the concert was happening. I had everything arranged for the big day. Unfortunately, my car broke down days prior to the concert, and the renting car place didn't have any available vehicles for the weekend. My concert pal, Jamal I was working in Boston that day, and he was going to meet me at the concert instead. Due to circumstances, I decided to book an Airbnb for Jamal and I to stay the night. I ended up taking the bus after my shift at the hospital ended. I arrived at the bus terminal 
and request an Uber to take me to my Airbnb, where I was planning to take a nap and change clothes before heading out to the concert. A grey Toyota Corolla that matched the description arrived. A very young guy greeted me and started with the usual conversation. I gave him vague answers, but it was inevitable for him to notice that I was a doctor, as I was still wearing my blue scrubs and crocs. Ten minutes into the drive, the driver offered to buy me food at a Chick-fil-A. I politely refused him, but he ended up going to the drive through because it was on the way. He bought me a sandwich and a soda, in spite of my refusal. He started asking me if I was single, the reason why I was visiting the city, and if I was traveling alone. I vaguely told him about the concert, avoiding giving too much detail. The driver then started talking about how he was driving one of his friends to Boston, and it was a shame he couldn't take me to the concert place, but that he can drive me back to my Airbnb after the show ended for free. I didn't say anything. I was too distracted, looking for the instructions on how to access the Airbnb, that I missed the driver saving my phone number in his phone. After the concert, Jamal went to the parking lot to retrieve his car. In the meantime, I continued chatting with some girls that I befriended until I received a call from an unknown number. I ignored it and continued talking. My phone kept ringing and I answered thinking maybe it was someone from the hospital because I didn't have my work phone with me. After the fifth time, I picked up and I recognized the voice of the Uber driver who was inviting me to a friend's party and that he was on his way to pick me up. My gut feeling was telling me how fishy this situation was. I firmly said no and then hung up. Two minutes later, the Uber driver texted me to let me know that he was five minutes away and that I needed to wait for him. I paled after reading the text. One of the girls noticed how nervous I was getting. Telling her my situation and showing her the text, she and her boyfriend decided to keep me company until my friend's car appeared in the corner. Saturday morning came by. During breakfast and while chatting about the concert, Jamal mentioned that Jason, one of the guys we met at the concert, sent him a Facebook message asking if we were okay. It seems that after we left, a group of four men in a grey car approached them asking about me. They decided to play dumb telling them that they haven't seen anybody with my characteristics, and then walked away. We reported him to Uber and deleted the app. I kept receiving phone calls from unknown numbers at odd hours in the night. I decided to change my phone number and avoid unnecessary trouble. Since that day, no more Uber for me. So, I drive for Uber, and believe it or not, I don't have too many weird experiences, or maybe I'm just used to them by now. But Judy, well, she's a whole different ball game. So it all started when I picked up this lady on a Sunday. I don't work many Sundays, but every single Sunday I work is super weird. There is something about Sundays. So I picked this lady up in the sticks, at some elderly care center type of place. Even though this lady came up in my car with the walker, I could tell she was full of energy. She was super friendly, had bright pink lipstick on, and was full of pep. She climbed into the front seat and told me I was taking her to Catholic Mass. Her story from there got weirder. She tells me she's not a Catholic, but that she wandered into a Hispanic Catholic prayer meeting one day when looking for a place to pray herself. She told me that though she doesn't understand a word, she now goes to the Hispanic Catholic Church when she can. She also tells me that she's a breast cancer survivor. She has one estranged daughter. She used to be a counselor and a dog and horse trainer. That she's a world traveler. That her heart is failing her and that her husband of 30 plus years is cheating on her and stalking her. I'm thinking, this is the craziest life. Is this lady telling the truth? I mean, truth can be stranger than fiction. The best way I can describe it is her stories sound crazy, but she seems rather normal in conversation. So I pull up to the church and drop her off. I get out of the car to get her walker all set up, and she comes up and grabs onto me, hugging me tight. 
She asks for prayer, and she begs me to tell her something troubling me, so she can pray for me. She then tells me she thinks it's divine intervention that we met, and asks for my phone number, so we can meet again. I'm also a photographer, and she was wanting some pictures of her and her dog at a property she lived at her whole life, prior to having heart surgery and having to be at this elderly rehab place. She had also told me that her ex-husband had tricked her to signing away the house while she was heavily medicated in the hospital, but that the house wasn't sold yet and we could meet her there for a photo shoot in a few weeks. A week or so goes by and she calls me. She says she's got a ride to the property and wants me to come meet her to look over the place and get some ideas for photos. I agree and drive even further into the sticks to get to her house. Let me tell you, this place was in the middle of nowhere. You had to take an unmarked road to get to an unmarked road to get to another unmarked road, etc. Her house was literally in the middle of the woods. If you didn't know this house was there, you would not stumble upon it randomly. I should add that I took a wrong turn while trying to get to her house and ended up getting my Hyundai accent stuck on this dirt road that was incredibly steep. I got stuck between these trees and thought there was no way I could get out. Judy came down the road in her walker and yelled out the directions until I finally freed myself. So I get out of the car and look around at this property. It's breathtaking. She has a wooden gazebo that she said her and her husband had built, and that when she was a counselor, she did her sessions out there, and her backyard is literally the forest. She tells me to look around for about 20 minutes or so, while she washes her hair in the trailer that she was staying in on the property. She told me due to complications, she can't be in the house. Before I go off to explore, she tells me more about her crazed ex-husband. She said he had been stealing her mail, that he would send people to drive by her house slowly and watch her, that he had cut her fence and let her horses out, and that he had recently poisoned two of her show dogs, etc. I still wasn't sure if this was the case, but I asked her if she had called the cops. She said yes, but then it was complicated. She told me the police did give her a new phone and that he wouldn't be able to get her new number. Oh yeah. She told me he was a computer whiz and kept breaking into her computer and all that jazz. So by this point, I'm thinking Judy has some issues. Nevertheless, why pass up an opportunity to explore this beautiful area and keep this lady company? So with the thought in my mind that Judy was crazy, I went back into the woods behind her house and began exploring. First, I came to this little shack. Curious, I looked inside and found these jars full of what looked to be science experiments. Not sure exactly what they were. I later asked Judy about them and she said, I'll tell you someday, dear. Not too long after I made my way up the side of the hill into a clearing, I saw a bunch of trees that had recently been cut down. Judy said that the forest service had been out there getting rid of some of the nature, so I didn't find it too odd. However, I then stumbled onto two piles of sticks very large piles that are smoking. I uncover what seems to be two campfires that have recently been put out and it looked to me like someone was trying to cover evidence of them being there. I rather quickly go back to Judy's house and tell her my findings. She immediately said, oh no, he's been camping out again watching what I do. Followed by, don't worry, he wouldn't kill you. Only me. I asked her if it could be a fire from the forestry service, but as we both thought about it, we figured they wouldn't leave it smoking, and not at 7.30pm on a Saturday. Right about then, as we're getting into the car, this burgundy pickup truck pulls up across the road from us and stops. The guy seems to be watching us. Judy tells me not to look, panicked, but to get in the car quickly. In an effort to see if this guy is honestly lurking, I start talking loudly about him and pointing in his direction. He sees me and peels out of there fast. This was an unstable dirt road, not one you peel down. Judy tells me she's sure he's the one who's been sent by her husband to watch her. We load her walker and her show dog into the car and head for the church. She gets out and goes to deliver something. Meanwhile, 
I'm sitting in my car with her dog. About 20 minutes later, I realize she's attending Catholic Mass. I had to go get her and make her get back in the car. I had to meet up with a friend shortly after, and I told her I needed to take her home. So, we get to the care center, and I help her inside. The night shift guy is there, and seems a little off himself. I look around, and there are creepy dolls on the walls, and old wallpaper. He asked her where she'd gone, and she says we were at my house. To which he replied, You went to the property. We'll talk after she leaves. And points to me. She then replies, I don't care. I can do it if I want. They already know what I'm doing. I don't have secrets. You know what's going on. I quickly excused myself with the promise of calling again. We texted a bit over the recent months, and as of now, Judy is moving out of her care home and into her own apartment. We are supposed to get together in a few weeks. As long as we are not tromping through the woods, I think we'll be okay. To this day, I don't, in God's name, know what is going on, and I'm not sure if I want to. I'm probably going to call the care facility at some point and see if they can give me any clues as to who this person is that I've been hanging out with. This was a story I grew up hearing that my mom would tell me. I was really young when this happened, and I know for a fact it was before I was five. I only have some foggy memory of the event, especially because at the time, my mom didn't want to freak me out. For some context first, we have family all over the country. I remember spending so much of my childhood just on road trips from state to state to visit family, so we knew our ins and outs of traveling. Secondly, when I was a child, I would randomly hug strangers and tell them I loved them. I was so filled with joy and love that it just spilled over onto other people. There was basically only one stranger I never immediately latched onto the second I saw them. And this is that story. So, my mom was taking me to visit some relatives while my dad stayed home with my brothers. She had to go house sit and in general is a better caretaker of me than my father is. So it made sense that I went with her. We were driving for hours until we finally hit a rest stop and got out to use the restroom. Now, there was already this guy in the parking lot and according to my mom, it looked like he was watching everyone who was entering and leaving the rest stop. The second we got out of the car, he started watching us. My mom held my hand as we headed into the restroom but immediately picked up on the fact I had let go of her hand to hold on to her other hand. The side of her away from the man. Looking back, she told me that it was clear somewhere in my tiny child brain that I picked up some sign of danger because I avoided the man as much as I could and would quicken my pace to the restroom and the car. I never did that with another stranger ever again. I had never blatantly avoided another adult like that. Anyways, we do our business and head back to the car. The man had gone back to his car and watched us leave, only to follow us in his own car. My mom immediately realized what was going on and tried to shake him off on the highway. He wouldn't budge and tried to get as close as he could. Apparently while doing this, a semi-truck driver noticed how frantic and off she was driving and could see her in the back of his car. He realized what was going on and drove up to her side and kind of made eye contact with her. They were on the same page from then on out. Turns out, the driver called up on his radio to other truck drivers and told them what was going on. A bunch of drivers from different routes nearby came onto the same highway we were traveling on. A few minutes later, they began blocking out the guy's car and essentially trapping him away from my mother and I as she turned onto an exit to get off the highway to another rest stop as the original truck driver followed us in. He got out and talked to my mom and told her he picked up on what was happening. He asked us if we were okay and drove with us to a Burger King and got us something to eat. We talked and he followed us back onto the road until eventually we went our separate routes. So, to the truck driver who probably saved our lives, thank you.
This happened nearly 20 years ago, but I will never forget it for the rest of my life. I went to a college in a very small town in northwestern Maryland. Our school sat in the foothill of the Catoctin Mountains. My friends and I would drive around the mountains, smoking weed. We got very comfortable on the roads and knew them very well. This story takes place before we knew the roads, when we just got to school. Several of my girlfriends and I went out for a ride at night. The roads are winding and narrow. Some parts drop right off the side of the mountain. And it was night time, so we were taking our time. We didn't see many cars when we would drive around, which was perfect. That night, however, as we pulled out of the parking lot, another car did as well. We didn't think much about it, as we thought it was another student. We enter the back roads, and the car is no longer behind us. As we go deeper into the mountains, a car comes up behind us. The car was getting very close to us, and we were getting freaked out. Mind you, we didn't know the roads very well yet, and they were backwoods roads, unpaved, and nowhere to turn around. I'm trying to drive as quickly as I can in order to get away from the car. All of us are freaking out and are convinced this person is out here and going to kill us. Finally, we see a chapel with a parking lot. We pull in, turn back to the road, and watch a red-haired man drive past us slowly, staring at us. We book it down the mountain, park our car, and call public safety to tell them what happened. A day later, we get an email from campus security telling us to look out for a man with red hair glasses, and a beard. He had been trying to get into the campus dorms and was following women around campus. A little while ago, when the summer was just at its end, my friend Rose and I decided to go for a drive up to the mountains. I grew up nearly out of the city limits and drove the mountain roads often. Rose is a newer friend in my life and had only been up to the mountains a few times before. I was eager to show her how cool it was at night, especially when you're headed back to town. You can see all the city lights as you're leaving the foothills. I love listening to creepy videos and watching scary movies, which may have been a big help for Rose and I on this particular night. We headed up in my van a dependable O3 Toyota, who had made the journey dozens of times before. There's a part where the pavement ends, and the gravel road takes you deeper into the mountain. Just beside this stretch of asphalt to gravel is a stretch of dirt that people use to park their trucks and trailers. Rose and I drove by, and I noted that the pullout was empty, as was normal for this time of night. It was about 10 p.m., the sun had set, and the lights with timers had all turned on in town. I had never seen any lights up on the mountain, though. Almost every farming field on the mountain is fenced off, with a locked gate that will say, private property, normally with bullet holes in the metal to show that the owners are armed and generally pissed off at idiots that try to break into their fields. Every field in the mountains are watered with a central pivot irrigation system. Those are the long, repeated arch systems with metal frames and wheels that are commonly seen all over the United States' as agricultural districts. I'd seen a few irrigation systems in town that have lights with timers on them, so at first, I wasn't too surprised when I saw one light in a field. We'd only gone a quarter mile in by now, but then I remembered that not only had the light not been there before, it was in the wrong place. Oh, fuck. I sighed, which was probably not what Rose wanted to hear in the middle of her first nighttime mountain excursion. What's up? Rose asked. Well, I know farmers are harvesting now, so I guess a light in a field makes sense. But at the same time, I have never seen that one before, I say, gesturing off to our right, where there is a very random amber light off at the edge of the field. It's dark enough that I can't see any fences or any of the boulder around it, but I was familiar enough with the mountains to know that it was the edge of a property. I started to tap on the wheel anxiously 
As I was filled with mixed emotions, I was eager to keep going because the mountains were going to be beautiful in the half moon and Rose had never seen them at night before. At the same time, my brain told me that if I'm going to listen to a few dozen hours of horror stories per month, I'd at least better get some meaning out of them. I'm sorry, Rose. I'd keep going if those were tractor headlights, but I've never just seen one light right there, especially in that field. I've never even seen it farmed, so it wouldn't make any sense to waste energy or money lighting it. Rose is amazing and didn't mind that we were turning around only a quarter mile in. We turn around and head back towards the asphalt. I had no idea why, but I felt like there was a clock that had suddenly started ticking. Hey, Rose, could you please hold the handle? I'm going to go fast enough that you might want to hold on to something. I promise we're safe. Rose silently clutched the oh shit handle above the passenger side of the car and I went faster. I felt the sense that it was time to hurry up, so I did. I zoomed back towards the asphalt as fast as I dared, my sense of trepidation only intensifying when we reached the truck parking zone. There was a white truck and a flatbed trailer that had not been there less than 10 minutes before. Five, maybe six guys were around the truck that had its headlights on. One guy was in a UTV, backing it off a flatbed trailer so fast that I thought he was going to crash into one of his friends. I raced by and someone ran behind the car. I turned onto a road that would lead me to a main road. Rose? I asked while inclining my way up to 70 miles per hour. Were those people there when we drove by earlier? I just wanted to make sure I wasn't crazy. No, Rose said. Uh huh, I sighed, copying her tone. Even as I jumped up to 75 and glanced in my rearview mirror, as far as I could tell, they weren't following us. But we had 8 miles of straight, flat roads, with no cover, before we actually managed to reach civilization. Did they seem like they were in a hurry to you? There was no other traffic, so we didn't have to slow down for anyone, which helped us both remain as calm as possible. Just a bit, she laughed nervously, looking over her shoulder to check for any cars as well. Thankfully, nobody came. We drove to a crowded restaurant and sat in the car while we calmed down. We tried to think of a reason why this guy had shown up so abruptly in the middle of the night. Rose suggested that maybe their friends were camping and in trouble. All the land in the mountains are private property, so nobody can camp out there. I'm glad Rose and I left, so we didn't have to find out why six guys decided they needed to rush up the mountain in the middle of the night. One or two months ago, my girlfriend and I went out to our favorite bar. The drive is a tad longer than an hour to our place from the bar, primarily on the Barron Interstate after the first 15 minutes, save for a few rural exits and one rest stop, a little over halfway home. My girlfriend was sober that night and was driving. I had a bit to drink and was feeling warm and tipsy. I asked my girlfriend to make a quick stop at the rest area so I could pee. This is a normal stop for us to make if one of us has been drinking, since the rest area has its own direct exit and entrance, so it's faster than taking an actual exit into a town for a gas station. The rest area has only one road in and out. It's surrounded by trees to the point that you can't see the facility from the freeway. It has wooded walking trails. By the time I hopped out of the car at the rest stop, it was sometime around 3 a.m. As mentioned, this is a fairly regular stop, and until that day, the only other person I had seen at the rest stop around that time of night was the guy who maintains it. I walk in. The vending area is empty and completely silent. I make my way over to the men's room and push it open to be immediately startled by this old man, maybe mid-60s or so, standing immediately to the left of the door inside the bathroom. He was wearing what I can only describe as an inspector gadget coat and slacks. 
I noticed he had his cell phone in his hand when I opened the door, but it was hanging down at his side, and the screen was not lit up. He stares at me, and I stare back for a split second. Then I get over it, and pass him to head over to the urinals. I take the urinal closest to the sinks, when I notice he made no indication he was going to walk out, because there's basically a wall of mirrors stretched out far enough that I can watch him in the mirror while I'm at the urinal. I unzip and keep my eyes on the mirror, but make sure not to turn my head at all. By the time I look in the mirror, his phone was up in his hand and on as if he was texting, but he seems to be staring at me rather than his phone. Either way, he definitely was not looking at his phone. A very long 60 seconds pass, and I absolutely cannot piss with this guy silently staring at my back from the door. Then, in the mirror, I notice him take a small step forward. I tell myself I'm just tipsy and imagining it, to just get on with my piss and get out of there. Then he takes a more obvious step forward. I put it back in my pants while I speed walk to the back handicapped stall and lock the door. I went to the back where my feet weren't visible and texted my girlfriend about this creepy guy inside with me. I sit and wait to hear the door open, signaling him leaving, but it still doesn't. After possibly the longest eight minutes of my life, I hear the door open and close. I wait another two minutes and finally pee. I crack the stall door first. Luckily the bathroom isn't huge, and I had almost complete visibility of the room from the stall I picked. I saw no signs of anyone else, so I walked out. I washed my hands, and beelined it back to the parking lot. I finally make it back to the car, and ask my girlfriend what the old guy got into. She turns to me wide-eyed, and says, He didn't get into anything. He just walked across the parking lot and went to the tree line, with the rest stop being the only thing on the very short on and off ramps, and the other closest civilization being five miles by interstate, I don't know where that guy was going. Later, I realized, although the rest area main room is small, there is a second exit on the side that goes to a patio, backing up to the woods. I forget about it, because I never use it, but if that guy had somehow managed to get a jump on me, he easily could have pulled me out of that door, and my girlfriend wouldn't have even seen it. I don't know if this was his plan, and I ruined it when I made a dash for the stall. This happened a few years ago, when I was still living with my mom, and I had to borrow her car to go see my then boyfriend for the evening. It was around midnight when I got to my neighborhood, so the roads were empty. And that's when I noticed this dirty, run-down, rusted, white utility van that a maintenance guy would drive, following me. I never saw the driver's face, but I got this immediate sinking feeling in my stomach because something felt wrong about this van. Now, I was only 20 at the time, but I knew better than to just drive straight to my house and let this person know exactly where I live. But I also wasn't 100% sure that they were actually following me yet. I didn't want to jump to conclusions, just because it was late and I was alone and being paranoid. So I drove to a shopping complex a few minutes out of the way, that is well lit and has a public library, to see if I was followed there. I thought I'd lost the van, but I decided to wait in the parking lot for a few minutes because I had a bad feeling I just couldn't shake. Sure enough, the van showed up, and it was driving in random circles around the parking lot, looking for me. That scared me quite a bit, so I drove towards the big mall here that's always got security and police presence. It was the midway point from where I was and where I lived. I parked in a pretty well-lit 24-hour McDonald's parking lot, where I had a great view of the roads and the mall, and I wasn't too easy to spot. I waited to see if the van showed up looking for me. It did. And of course, this would be the one time security and the cops are nowhere to be found, which was half the reason I decided to head there in the first place. 
realizing whoever was driving this van was 100% actively following me in the middle of the night. I knew just driving home was not an option, and that's a terrifying realization. Luckily, the police station is just a few minutes from where I was, so I try and discreetly drive away, hoping the van hasn't noticed me yet. I wasn't that lucky, because it wasn't long before the van was back in my rearview mirror. At this point, I'm panicking pretty hard, and my anxiety is high. I finally pulled into the police station parking lot, and seconds later, the van came to a stop in the middle of the road, for no more than a few seconds. I'm guessing just long enough for them to realize where I led them, and they took off immediately, and fast. I did make it home safe, and without seeing the van, not long after, but this whole ordeal took up at least an hour of my night. It was after 1am by the time I made it home, and I was terrified the whole time. I don't know what this guy's specific intention was, but honestly, I don't need to know. I know it was nothing good, and I likely avoided a very bad situation. If you think someone is following you, it's not stupid or paranoid to make sure you aren't right. Who knows what might have happened if I had led them to my house, or gotten out of my car. I'll start with some context. I live in Michigan. I won't specify what city, but it's incredibly safe. I mean, there's absolutely no crime besides domestic disputes and occasional stealing. Pretty close to Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. I suppose it's for this reason that my friend and I were targeted. Down the street from my house, there's a semi-large dog park. It's got a playground, some trails, and a big parking lot. In the day, it's used by plenty of people. It's an open area with housing all around it. All the streets next to it are filled with different associations, including mine that's barely a mile away. At night, the park is filled with a different crowd. Since it's safe and open, lots of people go to have sex in their cars and not be disturbed, or they smoke pot. My friends and I stopped in for the ladder. We parked our car in the middle of a row, a few spaces away from other cars, rolled the windows down a bit, and started chatting and smoking. Same thing we've done plenty of times. The parking lot is like a huge oval. Once you're in, you have to go all the way around to exit. My friend Morgan parked facing the entrance on the opposite side, with a divider in the center if we smelled bacon, so we could leave if need be. You never know. But enough context, I digress. Morgan and I had been sitting around for about ten minutes. A few cars passed through. Each time we watched carefully, wanting to always be aware of who was around us, and probably a small bit of paranoia. We kept a close eye until we saw no threat. Eventually, a large bright yellow truck pulled in. Now when I say large, I mean you'd have to hoist yourself into this thing. It was hard to miss. The windows were tinted, making it impossible to see into the cab. The driver pulled around the parking lot and went right for the exit. Not terribly slow and not rushing out. Like he was just turning around. Morgan and I made a few snide comments about his choice in color and moved on. No big deal, right? We sat for another 15 minutes, had a deep and meaningful talk, smoked some more, then saw it was almost midnight. Obviously it was time to go home. Morgan began to pull out of the park, looked both ways down the main street, and so did I. But something piqued my interest right away. The same yellow truck was driving by in the same direction we were headed. A little bit about me, I have severe anxiety, always have, and probably always will, so I'm usually nervous about usual things. I've had issues in the past that caused me to be extra paranoid. I'll get nervous if I see someone twice in a grocery store, so my reaction to the truck was typical. It being noticeable, I told myself I was being silly, getting anxiety. Just because I noticed it, 
It didn't mean danger. I didn't say anything, and we continued home. My neighborhood is set up kind of strangely. Let me explain so this makes a bit of sense. There's a long winding road down the center. It's a straight shot to the very end of the houses, but off the side of the main road are small pods of houses. Mine is second to the last. Arriving at my house, Morgan and I started our goodbyes. When we were both stopped in the middle of our conversation, we sat silent as the same yellow truck drove past the exit of my circle and to the last circle of the main road. Morgan said to me, That's the same truck from before, right? I responded, Yeah. They drove by us, leaving the park too. We watched the entrance. There's no other exit from there. One entrance, one exit. So in a moment, he was driving past again on the main road. I was freaking out. Why was this guy here? This truck's never been here. It's too obvious to miss. It couldn't possibly be a coincidence. I started begging Morgan to come inside, telling her to just wait a few more minutes, making sure he leaves and doesn't follow her home. She tried brushing me off, saying it was fine, and there was no way he was following us home. As we sat and argued in our car, the truck pulled into the first entrance of my circle. He automatically pulled into a spot and turned off the car. My anxiety was screaming to run. There's no way this person wasn't following us. Morgan screamed, screw this, get inside. We shot out of the car. I dug through my purse, fumbling to get my keys, begging any god or any demon that would listen to me to let my key work and get us inside. Now I don't live alone. My younger sister lives with me, and my grandparents were visiting. They would be right inside. The only thing I could think about was the fact that my hard-ass West Virginia redneck grandfather was sitting downstairs with his rifle next to his chair, and he would know what to do. With Morgan right behind me, I flung the door open on the first twist of my key. Thank God. We ran in slamming the door behind us, shaking violently. I scrambled down to where my grandfather was, screaming his name out of panic. He jumped up and started calming me and Morgan. After telling him what happened, we began to realize how stupid we must have sounded. He said we were probably paranoid from the weed. We calmed down, and my grandfather said he would check it out. He just needed Morgan to move her car from the front door. We agreed to go out and park it together, buddy system for life. We tried to laugh everything off, saying how silly we must have sounded running through the door like that. All sense of comfort was lost as soon as Morgan walked down my front steps. She gasped and turned around so fast, I barely had time to react. She screamed, he's right there. Apparently when she looked around the corner, the truck was driving directly towards us and the car. Barely a few feet away, we clambered inside and as I closed the door, I saw the truck peel off past my door. We ran back into the house and into the kitchen, which looks into the circle, where my family was staring out the windows. They watched the truck pull around the main road, back to my house, over and over. It felt like being stalked in my own home. I felt like I was going to puke. I could barely keep from crying. Once again, the truck pulled out and my grandfather wanted to take action. With gun in hand, he got ready to leave. He asked if I wanted to go along. I felt compelled to find out what this creep's problem was. We hopped in his car and pulled out to the main road. Almost as soon as we pulled out, we saw the truck pull out of another circle. I started to flip. I kept yelling, that's him. My grandpa told me to calm down and pay attention. The person in the truck hadn't seen this car and didn't know it was us. We watched as he pulled around into our circle, past my house, and then to the exit. The same exact exit our car was approaching. My stomach was in my throat. My shaking got worse as we began to drive towards him. Just as the truck tried to pass next to us, my grandfather pulled the front of his car directly in front of the truck, flashing his high beams into the cab. There was an older man driving the truck. 
He had wire rimmed glasses, balding head, with a white t-shirt. You couldn't get more ordinary. I saw him yell, oh shit, before reversing and doing a full 180 towards the other exit of the circle, back to the main road. My grandfather wanted this guy to get the hell out of Dodge. He slammed on the gas and sped right behind this dude, navigating through the winding road at 80 miles per hour in a 25 mile per hour zone, and that was nothing short of a heart attack. We chased him out of my complex and down the street. Unfortunately, other cars got in the way and he sped off on the highway. I kept my shit together until we finally turned around to go home. After trying to look for the truck, I broke down and started crying. The man I saw seriously resembled my estranged abusive father, who was supposed to be states away. I asked my grandfather if he saw what I saw, and in return, he simply rubbed my back and told me it would be okay. Returning home, we told the rest of the family. They'd seen us pull away and chase after the car, but there's not much visibility from my porch. We called the police and made a report. When first asked our address, the operator responded, Are you sure? You guys don't get crime out there. That gave me a good laugh. Nothing came from the report. No one reported a truck in the area doing anything, and we never got a license plate. No explanation as to who or what this person wanted. A sort of side note. My sister and I had a weird moment before everything. She told me once everything calmed down, that right before I burst into the door, she had a feeling something was off. She was thinking to herself, wondering if I was okay. Maybe just intuition, but I like to think it was more. Anyways, creepy bald dude who likes to stalk pretty young girls. You'd better hope we don't meet again. My grandfather is waiting.